This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. And relax. Um, I guess in the in the course of the next twenty four hours or, or twenty seven hours, twenty four and a half, twenty five hours, you are going to be hearing in some detail from the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. It could be the man that I presume you've been listening to for the last hour. I appreciate that, um, uh, that there is some movement on the, on the radio dial around the 10 o'clock bit. But um, uh, I, I think today is possibly one of those days where, 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 where we look in the rearview mirror. Now, I have to be conscious of the fact that you may not have listened to Keir Starmer um, being interviewed by Nick on the breakfast show. But... I, 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 I tell you what the phrase, I've got one word in my mind, and you're going to find it a little bit sniggersome, I think. And that word is unclenching. I think we're entering into a pre-election period of unclenching, which means that people who are keen to see the back of the Tories, or, and I don't think these are necessarily exactly the same people, people who are keen to see Sir Keir Starmer as Prime Minister, can perhaps begin to unclench. I think Keir Starmer is beginning to unclench. I think we've entered a period now where the vase is probably safe. Don't you? Unless so, unless a metaphorical bomb goes off. I, I think we've entered a period where the vase is probably safe. And I, it might be time, therefore just to now have a chat about what you think of him. But the problem with that is, if you think the same today that you thought six months ago, I don't think it's very interesting, uh, especially if your attitudes or your opinions are born of previous loyalties and prejudices, you know, whether it's footballification and you could never like a Labour politician or it's um, sectarian infighting our most powerful line i think that i've ever heard in the context of british politics is that the right wing are always looking for recruits and the left wing are always looking for traitors to expel I, I, it's, it's a broad brush stroke but goodness me i, I think it's a, an accurate one but i am describing to you a mass unclenching i know isaac's already saying don't say it out loud uh, and and that is because the gulf now between the two parties is so immense that uh, um, I, I, you just can't. Yesterday we couldn't see a way back for the Tories. Today the question is almost you 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 can't uh, you can't quite see how Labour can mess it up now, can you? Is that the phone in? How might Labour mess it up now? Uh, you know how desperate things are for the right-wing media because they've started putting quotes in their headlines. So they are accusing Labour of things that Labour haven't said they're going to do. So you've got these, this wonderful sort of state of affairs where the right-wing media is writing scare stories about things that literally nobody has suggested are going to happen. And, and that's a sign of desperation. There are other articles about how, I mean, who is... Who, who is this 20%, this, th these people who are still intending to vote for the Tories a fortnight on Thursday? Who the hell are they? Because, you know, if you if you've boiled, brain's a bit boiled, you've already lurched further to the right, and you, um, uh, if you think you're vaguely sensible, how can you possibly be on board with what's been unfolding for the last fortnight? Vinny says that you telling me to unclench is making me clench. I'm not telling you to unclench, and it's not hard, a very good point, in a, in a strong Welsh accent. Uh, we're all right. We're all right. But I, I just, it looks to me that he has, he's held it together this far. There's still a t two weeks and two days to go, but um, you can't take anything for granted. But the sign, the biggest sign of his confidence is, I think, some of the stuff he said about Brexit. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, or rather that's what I want you to talk to me about today. I want to know what the um uh, 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 i, I want to know how febrile this issue is i want because it, it, as he begins to talk about uh, uh the possibility of of closer ties uh, rachel reeves talking about re, re not quite realignment but talking about closer ties and the the fear or the claim from the, the media and the Conservative Party and indeed Boris Johnson, who I don't know if you've seen Boris Johnson lately, but he recorded a little clip last night that is absolutely 
I, I, he looks a bit like Father Jack out of um, Father Ted. Do you remember the, el- the elderly priest in Father Ted? It, except a sort of slightly more disheveled version of Father Jack out of Father Ted. And to think until relatively recently, he was, he was our Prime Minister. But this, I, I want to know how febrile you think the Brexit question still is. And, and by that, what I mean is... Starmer today, for the very first time, I felt, talked about it in a way that didn't make it feel like an, an exploded bomb. Until until now, I think that uh, it, it, he has, for reasons that are very easy to understand, they've talked about Brexit as if it were an unexploded bomb, uh, almost not going near it. And what he's tried to do is have his cake and eat it. He's tried to rule out single market membership, customs union membership, and... Um, and rejoining and yet at the same time lately latterly he has started to make noises about somehow changing the settlement changing the arrangement that we currently have now i'm very sorry to tell you as one of the patron saints of explaining the madness of brexit i don't know what he can do in this context i don't know what rachel reeves can do i i I think they might be um being a little bit disingenuous just just now acknowledging the existence of those of us who would like to see uh, 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 some repairing of the problems that have been inflicted and and a little less cowardice in the face of people shouting he wants to rejoin he wants to rejoin I, I, I don't know how much he can actually do in order to to improve the situation in which we currently find ourselves. And, and that, I think, is where, is where the conversation is going to go. So I want you to listen first to the question that Keir Starmer was asked by Connor in Manchester and, and to his answer. It's about three minutes long, but it's, uh, I think it marks a departure from where we were. Um, so this is where we are. Connor's in Manchester. Connor, you're on the radio. Go ahead. Good morning. Morning, Nick. Uh, morning, Sakir. Uh, I've just got morning, a question. Be- morning. Uh, I- I'm a left-leaning voter, uh, but I'm considering other parties because I don't feel that Labour is being uh, strong enough on things like Brexit. Uh, so my question is, is that if Labour is adamant on keeping Brexit and not joining the uh, rejoining the single market, what do you think the actual benefits of Brexit are and where do you see our relationship with the EU in the future? Yeah, Connor, look, firstly, on... Uh, very respectful of the choice that you'll make on the 4th of um, July, so not trying to tell you how to vote, but th- it is going to be a straight choice at this election, either to continue with the Tories in c- control, we've had 14 years now of chaos and division and failure, in my view. Um, that's one choice. I don't think they're going to change. I don't. Th- this campaign has shown that chaos and division are still part and parcel of their package. So that's not going to change. That's what you will wake up to on the 5th of July, um, unless you take the other route, which is to choose um, a Labour government, which will turn the page um, and begin to rebuild our country. They are the o- you know that's the only outcome um, or the only stark choice. So carry on as we are. Um, or turn the corner. On the question of Brexit, um, yes. Connor, obviously, um, as you probably know, I voted Remain and campaigned to Remain, but we have left the EU um, and we're not rejoining. Um, and that means that we're not going to rejoin the single market or customs union or reintroduce freedom of movement. So what would but, you look to? We would look well, to improve our trading relationships, says yeah. your colleague Rachel Rees. What does that mean? Uh, what well, that means, uh, Connor and, and Nick, is this, that I think the deal we've got is a botched deal. Talk to yes. any business. Talk, I was at Southampton Port yesterday. Talk to anyone who works at the border. And they will say that they've now got all sorts of checks and balances that aren't necessary that they think can be improved. I'm in the business of making it easier for people to so, so trade and to succeed. So what would you succeed. seek to change? So we would seek a better agreement. Obviously, this would have to be negotiated. Um, better where, in what areas? Uh, in trade, so that it's easier for businesses. I want it to be better in things like research and development. And I want it to be better on security because I think post the Ukraine or during the Ukraine conflict, it's become clear that we can do more work um, with our EU partners when it comes to defence and security. I would also add to that list, Nick, um, the taking down of the vile gangs that are running the uh, trade, the vile trade of putting people in boats to go across the small boats to go across the channel. At the moment, if we, we don't have the wherewithal, if we're on a 
joint investigation, joint project with them for the UK to lead on it. And I think that we can do better than that. So those are the areas, Connor, where I genuinely think uh, we can make some real progress. Uh, but I'd say at the end, you know, when, when it comes to okay. the, the ballot, it, it is a straight choice, Connor. And here's the thing. Here's, here's a phone and I didn't think we'd be having until about halfway through the next parliament. It, 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 what can they actually do? What, what can Labour actually do that would constitute improvements to the mess that Boris Johnson and David Frost have left behind? Uh, 0345 is the number that you need to answer that question. But the broader question on this issue that I want you to answer is... The word, the word I'm going to use is toxic. It's a better word than febrile, isn't it? I, I, although I like the word febrile. The, the Tory press, the Tory media, although... Oddly, quite a few of the cheerleaders have now gone silent. Quite a lot of the people who sold you Brexit have now gone fairly silent about it. But people like Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak still try and use it as a, as a battering ram. They try and use it as a weapon with which to hit Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer keeps saying, we will not rejoin the European Union. We will not join the single market. We will not join the customs union. And right wing politicians and some right-wing media keep saying he wants to rejoin the European Union. He wants to rejoin the European Union. How toxic is that accusation now? Especially perhaps if you voted to leave. How, how toxic is the accusation that Keir Starmer wants to row back on Brexit? It's, a, it's an accusation that Farage will make when he's not too busy trying to um, account for the number of Nazi sympathisers that seem to have ended up on his candidates list. But how, how toxic is the accusation that Keir Starmer wants to row back on Brexit? 0345 And then on the other side of this conversation, the, 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 perhaps the weirdest bit, how, how let down do people who want to row back on Brexit feel, by, feel about what he's saying? Uh, so I... I, I I find this really frustrating at the moment because I recognise the necessity of caution. I don't think the toxicity is enough anymore to, to justify the level of caution that we're seeing. But I think he knows how little wiggle room he actually has in this area, how little difference, how little change he can actually make, which is why when he says we're not going to join the single market, the customs union, or, or rejoin the European Union, he, he's... he's it's not even making a policy decision. He's simply telling the truth about the current reality. And that's something that a hell of a lot of people like me are going to find very hard to swallow. And if you're in business, if your life, your family, never mind your, your livelihood, is still being affected by the madness of Brexit, I don't think Keir Starmer has got the answers to your questions. And I, and I don't know how big a deal that is. So I've got two big deal flavoured questions. OK, the first is how toxic is the accusation that he wants to row back. How, how big a deal is that now politically? 12 months ago, it was huge. When he became leader, it was huge. Absolutely enormous. The accusation he wants to undo Brexit was a, a huge sort of Achilles heel. Now, I think it's probably almost a strength. So he wants to undo Brexit would be a vote winner. But of course, he can't. So what? what well, you, you tell me what sort of a mess you think we're in. 0345 6060 nine seven three james o'brien on lbc the, the the problem is this a reset is coming and you could tell today that keir starmer was talking about that I, it's not going to be anything like enough to delight remainers and the question of how much it's going to upset leavers given the size of the majority that keir starmer is likely to enjoy probably isn't relevant anymore so the, the, that's why but possibly I sound a little bit more confused than usual because we're addressing the single biggest political moment of our lives, quite possibly, and the need to undo it. And yet the path ahead is almost impossible to discern. Keir Starmer acknowledging, I think, for the first time today, uh, that, that the path ahead is very different, if you like, to the or from the path behind us. But what can he do and what will he do are quite possibly... Um, exactly the same question and what we miss is the lack of space the lack of movement that the current situation i.e the decision to leave will allow pete foster's brilliant on this pete foster of the financial times um talks about the eu being receptive on defense and security but how many of us 
are watching our, our livelihoods be affected or our families be torn apart by defence and security issues or even by carbon market issues on which there can be more alignment. On the simple question of trade, free movement of goods, even if we have full alignment with the European Union, we will not have access. So I, I don't know who's actually going to be more upset. The people who don't want him to... That, there's the question. Who's going to be more upset? The people who want him to backtrack on Brexit or the people who don't want him to backtrack on Brexit? Martin's in Coventry. Martin, what would you like to say? Uh, morning, James. Big fan. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I want to frame it in the 52 of the 48. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm a member of the 48. Okay. Right. And I'm completely angered by the fact that the whole of politics since 2016 has been pandered to the 52. Now, we're two and a half weeks away from the election, and we have Keir Starmer, who is still... OK, he's probably politically correct on what he's doing, but has pandered to the Red Wall and the 52. Uh, as in, I mean, not necessarily pandered to, but being far too conscious of not alienating or not upset. So you feel completely taken for granted. Right. I, I feel... I feel... Right, yeah. completely taken for granted since 2016 yeah. on almost on almost every level. Okay, I've got skin in the game because I I married a European. I was one of the lucky people, one of the lucky young. So, 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 did, so, so did Nigel Farage, mate. So it doesn't necessarily yeah. guarantee that you're going to be part of the 48. But I understand what you're saying. Right. So I, I, I luckily we had free movement, yes. and I worked in Europe as a young. Uh, sort of uh, young person and met somebody in Europe who was, who, was, uh, who came here and I took my, uh, my son I've got, I, I also understand how difficult it's been for families because my yeah. son was born in Europe and came here and we've since had difficulty with his passport and such so even though he was completely educated here there was one point after Brexit where he couldn't get a job because he couldn't prove he couldn't prove he was that he had an English passport, which is another thing that worked. Okay, so I've got skin in the game. Okay, but if you take that apart, since 2016, apart from your show and a few other... We, let's call let's call you a client journalist on the other side. Yeah, you know, we you, talk about client know. journalists on, on the other side. <laughs> well, I'm evidence based, I, mate. You're never going to hear me yes, claiming that Boris understand. Johnson is, yeah, Boris yeah. Johnson tells the truth, and I I, I, I perfectly critical yeah. of Labour politicians as well. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah. No, I I'm know what you're saying. I think we need a better phrase, but but I'll live with That's the one great. that you've used <laughs> for now. Okay, but I I feel I feel I'm angry, and I feel completely taken for granted by by by, by Labour. I understand Labour's journey. I understand Keir Starmer has had to... I understand his political... His, his how, how much he's politically had to move from Jeremy Corbyn, where I understand with some of the flack that you've taken. I, I, I'm, I'm completely on your page on that, what he's had to do to go to the centre. Right, but we've now got... If you, if you think now we're at a pivotal moment where we're talking about the VARs, yeah. is now safe, you, in my opinion... The country, right? The country will not. But the country is in a mess unless it goes back in the single market. Okay, and yeah. I think you can. I think you you're can, right. I think, and, and I think everybody who understands anything kind of knows that, including Keir Starmer and Rachel Reeves. But you're, yes. I think you're, you're 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 articulating what I'm trying to articulate, which is this slightly surreal sense of everybody knowing what you just said is true and. Keir Starmer being too frightened of saying it out loud still. So there's the question. When will he stop being frightened? Well, because you've got, to, you've got to stand up to the 52. Now, it's the same with immigration. It's the same argument with immigration. OK, now, I've watched... Well, that, that, the, well, I mean, it is the yeah, same yeah. argument, but it's not, it's not necessarily on the time, same time scale. When do you think he will, not should, but will, say out loud what we all know to be true with regard okay. to the single market. OK, but he's got, he's, got, he's got one last chance for me now. He's not okay. going to do he's it before moved... the election, you know that. No, he's not. No, so he's when... not going to do it before the election. Right. Let's just say he gets a majority. Let's not talk yeah. about that silly thing about the super thing that they're talking about. Let's sure. say he, he gets a majority, right, and he gets a big majority. OK? In my opinion, he has to move fast. OK? Right. Because, because the, the tanks of Farage will be on him 
almost immediately after that election. It's a Fisher Price tank, mate. These, I mean, I, I, I know what you mean in terms, but remember, the, 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 the whole Farage magnification thing only happens because we're in an election period. Um, uh, the, the, I, I don't know. I don't, and that's the first thing. That's why this phone-in is a little bit different from previous Brexit-flavoured phone-ins, is that I'm, I don't know. I, I've, I've known everything pretty much since 2016 about what was going to happen next. I've told you what was going to happen next. I explained to you what was possible and what wasn't possible. It's taken me 26 minutes to work this out, and I needed the, 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 the catalyst of, of Martin's contribution to work out why I feel so strange on this phone-in. We're having a phone-in about Brexit where I don't know what's going to happen next. For the first time since the vote, I don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, every single point of Brexit since that referendum result came in, uh, as soon as an event occurred, I could tell you with almost 100% accuracy what was going to happen next. I could tell you that, that, Le that Theresa May would be essentially held hostage by the lunatic fringe of her own party, which would, of course, eventually take over, that the promise to deliver the unicorns would continue to work politically until the moment that they claimed they delivered the unicorns, i.e. they got Brexit done. Remember that Farage greeted Boris Johnson's Brexit deal with, with party poppers. He, he rolled out the red carpet, greased Boris Johnson's passage into Parliament and heralded his Brexit deal. He said the war is over, it's done, we've won, and now he spends his whole life complaining about it. So I don't know what happens next. Maybe that's the only question I should have asked. What, what does happen next if, stroke, when Keir Starmer is in charge? What happens next? Josh is in Brussels. Josh, what would you like to say? Hello, James. Hello, How are you? Very well, mate. Good, good, good. Of my annual call to you. I, well, I'm very so, grateful. Uh, I'll check the calendar. So, what, I mean, a question has, has, <laughs> has moved slightly, but you can, you can answer either the yeah. one that we were asking before or the one that we're asking now. I'll try and do both. Mm. So, from a perspective of a Brit who lives in uh, the EU, yes. um, I think the road back... I think Keir Starmer's made one mistake, one which may be very costly. Not now. I think he'll secure the election quite easily. But I think what he hasn't anticipated is that, as you said at the very top of your show, that he hasn't anticipated that the people have seemed to have moved back to realising their mistake. Yeah. And the problem is, he's not prepared to, to actually verbalise that and say... Leaving the European Union, or even in the case it's of a saying, slightly leaving... glitchy phone line. I don't know why, but um, it, it, I'm just, I'll, I'll bear with you for a minute. But if it gets any worse, we might have to re recalibrate. Carry on. Okay, I'll, I'll stand. I'll stand. Stand and stop. I'll stand. It's still not you. It's, it's, it's something on the line. It sounds like there. It sounds like there's water on the wire or something like that. But but crack on for now with with that warning in place. No, we'll try, we'll try and fix that. It's coming out to half past ten. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. We'll come back to Josh, I think, after the news. Um, and and here, here it is, really. I, I hope you share some of my surprise at suddenly realising in the middle of this phone and why it feels different from every other conversation we've ever had about Brexit. Keir Starmer clearly is not going to leave the issue in the wardrobe. It, it is going to have to move to, to the front and centre at some point of British politics, but it's not going to move there yet. And when it does move there, it's not going to satisfy anybody, really. It's going to upset the people who still think they want to stay out, and it's going to upset the people who think that they want to go back in. So for the first time, I won't labour this point because it sounds a bit conceited, for the first time since 2016, I've got no idea what happens next which means it's time to ask you what you think is going to happen next. A lot of support for the first callers claim that sort of 48% of the population has been completely ignored. I, I, I don't agree with that entirely. I think the result had to be respected. I didn't think that immediately. I, I think I was wrong about the second referendum. I think people had to see the reality of what they had ushered in, even if the people who ushered it in would deny that it was their fault. The people who voted for it had to see it, but they have now, and it's only going to get worse. So what happens next? It's half past ten and Thomas Watts has your headlines. Sir Keir Starmer has refused to rule out allowing a council tax rise under a Labour government. The party leader, who's been taking part in an exclusive phone-in, has also committed to seeking a better Brexit deal. Rishi Sunak will be here to take calls from LBC listeners tomorrow morning. President Putin has promised to support North Korea to defend its interests. The Russian president has arrived in Pyongyang for his first trip to the country in 24 years. At least 11 people have died and more than 60 others are missing after two boats 
sank off southern Italy. Officials say they were carrying migrants who'd set off from Libya and Turkey. LBC weather, dry with sunny spells for many. Some showers in Scotland and across parts of central and northern England, a high of 22 degrees. This is LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Listen on your smart speaker. Just say, play LBC. I think I lied, uh, or at least I think I was being a bit optimistic when I said that I'd, I'd stop being so self-referential because I'm having a bit of a career crisis in the studio this morning. I've, I've suddenly realised this is the day on which I cease to be James O'Brexit. I, I, I surrender my crown as the king of the Remainers because my entire coverage of this topic has been based upon the fact that, that we've been right about everything. We've known what was going to happen next, including the, the, the capture of the Tory party by Farageist fantasy politics, which is, which is underway apace at the moment. It's all in my book. But today, I've no idea what happens next. I've no idea what happens next. And, and I think people who are on my side of the argument are in for much bigger disappointments than they realise. You think now, as the, as the ship begins to turn around and as a man who led calls for a second referendum, possibly um, or probably gets into Downing Street, you think that the, 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 the sort of road back to sanity is clear, but it's really not. Because A, they don't particularly want us at the moment, not while it has any um, uh, febrile connotations at all. The European Union is only going to really throw open the gates when... It is no longer a controversial issue in this country. And, and you've got the great unflushable still polluting British politics at the moment, which means this isn't going to go away as a, as a febrile topic. People who believe nonsense are still going to be able to exert um, influence on, on the political landscape. And Keir Starmer is not going to be able to do much. I mean, outside of some carbon policies and, and, and possibly some veterinary legislation that would need law, he's not going to be able to do much. You don't, you don't get access from alignment. The four freedoms, oh, sounding like the old me now where I know what I'm talking about, but the four freedoms are indivisible. So even if you agree to sign up to all EU regulation on trade, they'll still have to do checks. The, the four freedoms are not indivisible. So what the hell happens next? Let's go back to Brussels on a better line. Josh is there. Josh, where were we? Hi, James. Can you hear me clearly That's now? much better now. Fill your boots. Perfect. So... I think the road back is far more treacherous than the road out, as they say. So yes. 
What's, what I think is going to happen is, is that I think the key to what's going to happen as to how quickly Steer, Keir Starmer can move towards move, going back into the EU is dependent upon what happens, believe it or not, in the Tory party and the, the reform uh, Fisher-Price tank man. Mm. Because I think he would love to move faster, but he made a mistake, in my opinion, when he initially outlined years ago that he wouldn't join the single market in customs union. No, that, no that wasn't that, a mistake. It wasn't a mistake. It was necessary at the time. And now it, now it feels like an albatross around his neck or a millstone around his neck. But it was completely yes. necessary at the time. It was, but because he was trying to outflank uh, Boris Johnson. Well, he was, try, he was, uh, try, he was uh, not even outflank. He was just trying to take a weapon out of his hand. I think of all the things he's good at, that's what he's best at, is, is, is taking weapons out of... Yes. His opponent's hands. I, I agree with that. But the problem here is, is that any, if he wants to show an improvement in terms of getting growth and all the other things he's been talking about in this election, the problem is he's not got much wiggle room to do it. No. And, and that, that, therein lies the problem. So I think that the British people, those, the 52%, who have basically very, gone very quiet, mm. have you noticed, and, the, and, the, and the, the, those who've been waving their pom-poms, in the media they've gone very quiet on brexit because there are no benefits but i also feel at the time that brexit had to be materially felt by the people before they would realize what the importance of being in the eu was and i think people's pockets are lighter their food bills are heavier and they can't move goods around they're having to use their blue passports and join long queues and it had to be materially felt by the people. So the question then becomes, in my mind, mm. how does Keir Starmer, how does he tell the people you are wrong about what you, you did? You were and wrong. And that is just difficult. Yeah, you, you were, were wrong. wrong. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Which he, which he was do doing that? up until 2019. He was doing it all the time. But, but of course, when he became but, leader, he stopped. Yeah, but Brexit hadn't been materially felt in people's everyday lives. So now can you answer is. that question? Uh, I think because I can't. This is can... why I'm in such. This is such an unfamiliar position for me to be in on a Brexit phone. In is I, I really don't know whether I'm coming or going. I think you're being a bit. I think you're being too kind to yourself. I think you have some ideas. I don't. But my, my my no really no. okay. Well, my maybe. I mean, like, I could say something glib, like it, I think it will be an issue in the 2029 election. But I mean, what does that even mean? I, I think it's going to be far quicker than that, James. I think the pressure. I think what, my my own personal view on it is that. I think what happens with the Tory party, if there is a kind of one nation that comes out of it and the rest of the rump of the right wingers go with reform, yeah. I have a strange feeling that the Conservative Party is going to change tack and they're going to say we need to be in the single market oh, and the customs on. union. That would be mad. Oh, I'm telling you. I know, I know. Well, listen, this is the thing, though. Good. When everything's up, when it's up, listen, if I don't know whether I'm coming or going, then everything's up for grabs. And that, that makes sense. If, if, if yeah. the, you know... And, of course, one way that Starmer might be able to, if, if there is an, a, a sort of substantive threat from, from Farage, and, and history teaches us that being catnip for Nazis and fascists doesn't damage his popularity among his base, um, then, then maybe what you do is, is you remind everybody of his responsibility for, for, for Brexit, which somehow you, most journalists are, are ducking at the moment, not reminding him that he's the man who lied loudest and longest about it and cheered Boris Johnson all the way into Downing Street and hailed his so-called deal as um, the promised land. They did. But the problem with those journalists that are accommodating Nigel Farage without actually taking him to task for what he has done... Good morning, Britain did a good job this morning. Good morning, Britain did they, a good job. Ed Balls and Susanna they did. Reid. They did, but they need to be much more... On, say, well, look, this is what... They need to be material with the facts. Remember those? Mm. What they need to do is say, look, these are the facts. Brexit hasn't worked. Are you... Even he said it. Yeah. He said... Farage said Brexit hasn't worked. And the, but he's come up with some nonsense about the wrong type of Brexit. Goes to a different it's school. rubbish. And, and I don't think if you have the same argument again, I think he's going to find it a lot harder because, one, those journalists who have, who have been avoiding asking him those questions are going to come under increasing scrutiny and Farage if he does make it to parliament I hope not he's going to be in, under intense scrutiny to answer those questions about what his form of Brexit is reality and how would uh, I mean they're, they're yeah. always confi confine him to the realm of reality and uh, he'll fall apart quicker than a cheap suit that, that, that's always been true but for reasons that I don't I don't fully understand and, and I don't want to explore 
unduly, very, very, very few people have managed to confine him to the realm of reality. And it, 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 one thing I can say with some confidence is that it's really not that hard. 10.41 is the time. Great stuff, Josh. You may maybe break your record and phone me twice um, this year because we're going to be having post-election conversations fairly soon. Pete is in Peterhead, which, for reasons I don't fully understand, Pete, delights me on, on a level that is quite uh, disproportionate. One day I want to do an entire phone-in for people whose name and location are as closely related as yours. Peter in Peterhead. <laughs> I thought you meant because you liked the location. No, I do like uh, the location. But though, <laughs> do you remember, how old are you? Can I ask? I'm 46. Do you remember, I, you may be slightly too young, there was a Halifax advert and, the, and it was a song and every single person mentioned in the song had their name in their place name yeah the, the, i remember that, you yeah. do so so like don don in doncaster pete in peterhead <laughs> the whole thing and it's my dream one day to do an entire hour of phoning with everybody in that category but i'm distracting you what would you like to say what do you think is going to happen uh okay um so uh, basically what i thought was that um you know the, the turnout for the brexit referendum was pretty low mm. uh, and the people who didn't vote i mean they probably what I think probably happened is that nobody actually thought it was going to happen in the first place, so they didn't even bother going out and voting. But the crazies who wanted to vote for Brexit didn't actually go out and vote. Yes, and that's why that's why we ended up with uh, uh, that was a large a part of it. But, but but I mean, yeah. that, you know, that ship has sailed. So uh, the, turn, yeah, yeah, the totally. turnout was over seventy percent, actually, Pete. I don't, I don't know if that counts as low. I think that's quite quite high. But but anyway, what what's going to happen next? Um, well, you know, it's it's uh, it's all well and good. Uh, Keir Starmer sitting saying that uh, he's going to, you know, negotiate a new deal yeah. and everything. That's fair enough. I hope he does because it'll benefit everyone. But as far as a, a second Brexit referendum goes, that that'll never happen. That's never going to happen. And in and, which case, uh, in which case, none of the the the, the, the really meaningful improvement, single market, customs union, that, that they're never going to happen either. Yeah, yeah, because obviously it would have to be put to a vote because it would be changing everything that Brexit stood for. Yeah, that's true. Uh, even though it was lies. Um, oh, unless it just became so self-evident that, that, you know, the only people calling for a vote would be the sort of um, uh, continuity gammon, really. There'd, there'd be literally nobody sensible or, or informed still calling for a well, vote because it had become so blindingly think, obvious to everybody else that becoming the first population in the history of humanity to vote to impose economic sanctions on itself was an act of unparalleled madness. Yeah, I think after after eight years, uh, uh, you know, sitting through this, and I think people would probably, a lot of people would probably change their mind. It's a lot of people are too, yeah. maybe too scared or too... Uh, to, uh, yeah, no, well, double down syndrome you know, or whatever it's called, yeah. right, where you can't admit you but, can't admit a mistake. So, what do you think is going to happen then? Because not nothing well, big think, can move. I, I think the Tories, the Tories and the and Labour Party have really painted themselves in a corner with Brexit. The fact that um, you, yeah, they spent 2014 telling Scotland that they couldn't, you know, that they're going to be out of the sing, uh, out of single market, out of Europe, the pensions are going to go and everything. Uh, so vote no in the, in the Scottish mm. referendum. So we did, uh, and then after that they said, they said, "Well, you know, we're out. You can't have another referendum. It's a once in a generation. Uh, there's no chance of having another one." Uh, and I think, uh, you know, with, with the way that Scotland has been vocal uh, with the fact that they do want another referendum, um, you may, you might not see it too much down south, yeah. but you know, it is, it is pretty prominent up in Scotland. It, it doesn't get a lot of airtime anyway. But I think if they if they turned around and said, right, we're going to have another Brexit referendum, things would go absolutely nuts in Scotland because, you know, we've been denied you, another you, vote for years. Crikey, yeah, it is, it is a wrinkle. Yeah. Although, albeit that it gives Scotland the chance to um, uh, get what it voted for in 2016, even, even if it's not what it voted for in the, in the independence referendum. I, the, the crucial point, I think I've identified the elephant in the room. And this is for the UK, not not the, that's a Scottish elephant that Pete's just identified. But the the elephant in the room is that alignment, which you can do without negotiation, you can just agree to do it, doesn't deliver access. You cannot unilaterally align your way out of post Brexit border checks. So whether you're talking about chemicals or or, or, or sausages, even if you make it law for every UK company to abide by EU regulations, 
you will still need paperwork at the border. You will still need to demonstrate compliance at the border because alignment is... Well, you cannot align your way out of post-Brexit border checks. And that's why I'm on this unfamiliar tip this morning of not knowing how this shakes down. So I know what the facts are, but I don't know how... I don't know what happens when the facts meet the politics. You can't. You see, all the people calling for single market or, or, or customs union or even who seem to think that there's some sort of middle ground where you can realign and therefore not have the checks, you can't. That's the whole point about the indivisibility of the four freedoms. So what the hell is going to happen next? And, and I'm beginning to think, 45 minutes into this conversation, I'm beginning to think that Starmer might have got this right as well because he's not getting anybody's hopes up. I think we can all agree about that, right? He's not getting anybody's hopes up. And in fact, the people who want less Brexit is, are probably poised to be more upset in the coming years than the people who want more Brexit. There you go. There's a theory. It's 10.47. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 10 to 11. You have until midnight tonight or 23.59 BST to be absolutely precise to register to vote if, if you haven't done it. So just do it. Only takes about five minutes. You can do it online. Um, what I would say to you, if you're, if you're sort of hesitating or pausing in any way, shape or form, just, just go online and try to do it. And if you can't do it, you can't, but you almost certainly can. And it is, um, it's incredibly straightforward. All you need to do is go to gov.uk forward slash register to vote with hyphens. Now that'll open in, in a new window. All you need to be is 18 or over on polling day. So you need to be 18 or over on July the 4th um, and a British, Irish or qualifying Commonwealth citizen. So just, just go and do it because at the moment there is a danger of the older generations who have arguably delivered some of the... Uh, some of the damage that the country is currently enduring with their votes in recent years, setting too much of, of the agenda for this election as well. It's, it's younger people, poorer people who are disproportionately represented in the numbers who haven't yet signed up, who haven't yet registered to vote. So, so just go to gov.co.uk forward slash register hyphen to hyphen vote or just Google um, register to vote UK and it will come up. And, and remember, if you're 17 now but you're 18 next week or the week after you can you can register to do it as well and there, there is no greater relationship with your with the democratic process than your um than your actual right to the ballot box 10 52 is the time natasha clark is here lbc's political editor big day today and tomorrow with keir starmer and rishi sunak both taking calls and, and properly taking calls a full hour doing 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 it properly i'm not sure uh, anyone else is getting that sort of level of access. What, what, what were the big takeaways from Keir Starmer's appearance this morning? I think my main big takeaway is just how calm he seemed today. Mm. He seemed very uh, confident in what he was saying. He didn't have any stumbles. He didn't trip over anything. He didn't even have, uh, as far as I could see, any notes beside him when he was sitting in, fact, in this chair mm. a couple of uh, half an hour ago. He did just seemed like a man that genuinely felt like he was he had it all together. Um, he had all of his answers. He obviously faced some really tough questions, including some I imagine that he wouldn't have expected. Things like the Northern Ireland Legacy Act. He was mm. challenged by a veteran saying you're going to open up a witch hunt for, for my uh, fellow veterans once again. He wouldn't have been prepared for that answer, but he did uh, have answers for everything. And obviously that he is... He would have been DPP when some of this was it, put in place, though. So, I mean, exactly. it, it's, a, it's an unexpected uh, uh, curveball, but not necessarily one he wouldn't no. be able to play. And after, you know, so long on the campaign trail, we've had, you know, three and a half weeks of this campaign now. I imagine he has been thrown nearly every single question mm. he potentially is going to get thrown. And obviously our job is to try and get some callers to ask him something a little bit different, which he may not have heard before. But I think he did genuinely bat every single question off pretty uh, well. Um, interestingly as well, he repeatedly defended himself on private schools. That's obviously something that, that we and LBC have, have talked quite a lot about from both sides of the debate. We've heard from schools who were worried about the impact on it. We've also heard from parents, from teachers. We've also heard from people that, are, that really love the policy and, uh, and wants to see uh, it rolled out across schools so that we can get more money into, into it, state schools it, too. This is really interesting because there is a, of all the subjects that I think are magnified by the background of journalists in this country. I suspect that the private education 
issue is the biggest because almost all of us who have achieved a degree of prominence mm. in the UK media went to private school. Not, yeah. not everybody. Not everyone. Not everybody. Not everyone. But almost all of us. <laughs> Certainly hard to think of editor level. You know, even Paul Dacre. Uh, everybody went mm. to private school. So the sense that it's a much bigger issue in editorial conferences and studios than it, than it is it's anywhere also, it, else. It's also just a really big talker. It, it's, it's, it's one well, that we, we get called that today. all We love the, time. the topic. Yeah. But I don't know how many electoral needles... Should we have a listen to how he dealt with the question on VAT? For, yeah, for absolutely. There school? we go. Here's, here's the clip. Mike in Berkshire. I'm in a region... I'm in a marginal Berkshire seat. I've given up on the Tories. I would be minded to give Labour a chance. But I seem to be one of those people the Labour have chosen to despise. I'm a moderately successful aspirational parent who's elected to choose private education. VAT at 20% feels like a super tax on me. He is not alone. The head teacher of the school that your wife attended says this will cause significant disruption for children forced to leave school but we're even more concerned about the capacity of local schools. The head of the school that you attended, Rygate Grammar, says this will inevitably lead to thousands of children going to already oversubscribed state schools. How come you know better than all these teachers? Well, Nick, I, 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 firstly, um, I've got nothing against private schools, and I do understand that many parents save hard and work hard to send their children to private schools because they have real aspiration for them. But I also understand... Um, that all parents have aspiration for their children, including parents who send their children to uh, a state school. And I want to make sure that every single child, wherever they come from, whatever their background, has the opportunity to get on in life. And why why is this such a hot topic? I don't know. No, I, I want to tell you. Go. I think it's because it, it, it reaches back to what the Labour Party stand for, right? Keir Starmer uh, and the Labour Party, Tony Blair wants to be the party of aspiration. He said he didn't want to, to tax wealth. Mm, he didn't mm. want that to be a dirty word. And this all b goes back to, I think, what he's trying to, to change the Labour Party ah, into being. So That's... it changes the, the mood music without actually changing that many people's lives. It just it just creates... It's about a, what it signifies and what it represents. That's a really clever observation. It, it, it says we are actually about addressing the unfair distributions and in this country. But we're, this is a tiny tinker, but it speaks to a much bigger issue. It does, and exactly the problem is, right. though, on the other side of the equation, you've got things like the two-child benefit cap, which he deliberately doesn't want to send that signal mm. for, and he doesn't want to... Because he, it would cost so much. It wouldn't cost anything at all. It cost something like £1.52 billion. Right? Pounds. I no. thought it was hugely expensive. To, no, two-child benefit cap, I don't think it's, don't think it's very much at all. Um, potentially a little bit more, but I thought I'd read that it was around £2 billion. Um, um, but that's something that I think he wants to make a principle on. I think he wants to make a principle on the point of VAT on school fees, believing that this is something that, that if, you know, if you're only a small slither of people that go to private education, 7% of kids, I think, privately educated, he believes that for the, for the greater good of kids in private in, in, in uh, non-private schools, have gone it's up worth loads doing in the it. last 20 years as well. Loads and loads and loads. Uh, yeah, I mm. mean, the, my, my old school now costs about a million pounds a term. But the, So, you know, the, 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 Mike, the listener's not here to... Um, uh, defend himself, but claiming that you feel despised because uh, you, you're being asked to pay VAT on your school fees, I, I, forgive me, it's pathetic, really. That's real world's smallest fight. Where was it when the yeah. bedroom tax came in, I wonder? Yeah, and, 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 and various know, other very for, punitive policies that hit the poorest people in the mm. country right between the legs. But for Sakir Starmer, he's trying to appeal to those Tory voters, yeah. those people that used to back the Conservatives that might now come across to the Labour Party. And that, a lot of people think, is an incredibly damaging policy for that because they believe that it will hit them in the wallet. So it's a, it's a really tough balance that he's trying uh, to strike. And, and, you know, he went on to talk about how the fact that he's changed the Labour Party. And obviously you talked sort of at the top of the show about this. Is he being careful enough to win this now? Uh, is, does, is he feeling confident enough? He looked to me like a man that, that does uh, feel like things are going very well we for him. We use the word unclenching, Natasha. I don't know. If you use the word indelicate. unclenching. Yeah, but is it, I mean, it describes <laughs> what you're alluding to, doesn't it? There is a sense of unclenching, both in the uh, the leadership and in the in the support. I think. Well, of course, he's doing so well in the polls. Everything is pointing to the fact that he's doing so well um, and is is expected to do well in this election you know and he makes no apologies for the fact that he's changed the party he did admit that he would have served under a jeremy yes. corbyn prime minister which was a very interesting admission was it that's i mean he was yeah he was in the shadow cabinet he kind of couldn't have not been in the of cabinet course, in the event yeah. of an election it's all a bit of a gotcha it, 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 yeah, potentially but equally it, this is a guy that he's now you know slacking off he's now trying to discredit jeremy yes. corbyn he's bumped him out of the party he's, he's outside the tent but, yes, um, but it, charlie it, puts it perhaps more pithily than we managed to the private school thing is a beacon to the left 
Starmer so, so telling them he hasn't forgotten them. Potentially. Because it is the kind of thing that historically they like. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's working. What else? What else have we got? Um, I think also I wanted to touch on more of his plans for Israel-Palestine. Mm. Um, this is something that we know has hurt voters in certain communities. We know that his previous LBC interview where he appeared to suggest that he would cut off water supplies to Gaza in, uh, in self-defence of Israel, that got him into a real sticky muddle. We don't quite know whether that's going to have an effect on the polls and the voters uh, or not. But today he revealed a bit more details about plans for what a Palestine and Israel deal would look like. I've oh said repeatedly, Israel has to um, exercise its I, right I, I to self-defence within to international law. No, uh, Abby, and anyway, I'm, I'm not going to sit in an LBC studio and pronounce that something is either genocide or not. And so I tell you, well, I will tell you for why, Nick. Um, I so have. Here, you can't decide about the guns, uh, the weapons. I'm sorry, you can't decide about genocide. Why, Nick? Uh, uh, allow me, please. In the fall of Yugoslavia. Um, all sorts of atrocities were committed. I represented Croatia in the International Court for three months where we argued about genocide. We reviewed three months' worth of evidence. At the end of that, the court itself then had to make a decision based on all of the evidence. That's how it works. Much... Um more competent response than in the interview you referred to from... Yeah, uh, exactly. He's clearly um, cleaned up his, his, his response on that. He won't go so far as to call it a genocide. I'm sure some people will be very angry to hear those words, but saying it's not for me to decide, it's for a court to decide mm. those sort of actions. But also laying a little bit more of the flesh on the bones about what a peace deal for Palestine looks like. He's saying that the conditions are not, not yet there for a stable state of Israel, for a viable, I think he called it, state of Palestine. But that will be really interesting to see. He's obviously trying to flesh that on the bones to try uh, and repair some of the damage, I think, from that previous interview. I am told, and, and this may be the basis of my next phone in actually on the program that the ground game as it were the ground campaign is not reporting much love yet for Keir Starmer on the doorsteps why, why, why might that be? Uh, as we were sort of discussing off air, is it because Keir Starmer is being honest with what he can promise the voters? He's not. He's not making. He's big not making inflated. big outlanders promises. He's not making Nigel Farage-esque claims about the amount of money that we've got to spend. He's being very honest. The finances are very tight. He, you know, said repeatedly he doesn't have a magic wand and he can't sell you the earth. Um, and he's trying to be honest about it. Maybe. I, I mean, Sunak could possibly fit into that category as well. He definitely potentially did, obviously, during the last Early Tory doors, leadership But he's, but he's, he's, swerved, he's swerved a bit since. And, and I, that, I think that's a really good... Um, I think that's a really good analysis. And it's a really interesting question, isn't it? Can we remember... I, I, you're too young. I, I wasn't paying attention in 1997. But did, did, did Tony Blair enjoy messianic status among voters, even as his opinion poll leads were, were this sort of size? Well, actually, there was a book that I think one, a fellow journalist was tweeting an extract mm. from a couple of weeks ago, saying that even in 1997, the media, the polls are saying yeah. exactly the same thing. No one's enthused about uh, Tony Blair... You know, he's not quite the same. How he's your not got own the same memory cell. rewrites history, isn't it? Because exactly. I, I mean, everybody the, thinks yeah. now that he is absolutely the answer. The, the, well, the, 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 partly the scenes on Downing Street that night, and and also I think D Ream have a lot to answer for. They do. I think that things can only get better. Anthem is part of our collective memory, whereas in fact at the time maybe there wasn't much love for Kit, for Tony Blair on the doorsteps. Um, Natasha Clark, many thanks indeed. Uh, Rishi Sunak in the in the in the chair. You'll be in the tomorrow. hot seat tomorrow. Hold on to your hats. It's three minutes after 11. James O'Brien on LBC. Seven minutes after 11. So we'll have a Starmarama phone in now. But in the, in the final hour of the programme, either we're going to look at why conversations about private education obsess all corners of this country so much when the issue affects such a small amount of people, or we will look at the question of why so many Nazi and fascist sympathisers are historically drawn to whatever organisation Nigel Farage is, is leading at the time. I don't know if you've seen the latest story, but when you've got a headline that says Reform Candidate Defends His Comments About Hitler, um, and that's two, I think, in a week. Then you, anyway, you, you, you've potentially got a little bit of a problem. Um, I am told. So I'm, I'm going to tell you something I don't know that you are fully clear about. And and it, it, sometimes when I say I'm not criticising anybody else, I, I, I mean it. On this occasion, I am actually criticising other people. I'm, I'm not going to name any. But I don't think that people who do what I do for a living should hang out with politicians. I don't even think we should go out for lunch with them, regardless of what party they're from or regardless of what... Um, 
uh, a, a background there may be, or, or possibly, I guess, if if it's the only way you can get people to appear on your program, then I, I'd have to wind my neck in a bit because we, we've managed to create a program that doesn't need politicians to appear on it, and and I much prefer it that way. I genuinely would much rather talk to you every morning than to whichever minister has been put up to to to, to do the sort of studio rounds. But I really don't think we should socialise. I, I, I don't think that politicians should, should socialise with journalists. And this puts me in a really stupid place because they do little else. You know, the, the, the House of Commons is full of bars and restaurants where journalists and politicians are constantly socialising. It, 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 it's different if you're reporting political news. So for Natasha not to socialise with politicians would be bloody ridiculous. But for those of us who've been lucky enough to achieve a status or to get a job where you're commenting on the politics without actually having to uh, butter anybody up in the hope of getting a story for Saturday's paper or in the hope of getting an exclusive for your uh, for your radio station or your TV station. I honestly don't think that any of us should be socialising with these people, going to their party. I was invited to Downing Street recently for, for a charity event uh, of a charity that I actually support, but I thought I can't go. Number one, who am I going to bump into? I just don't think it's appropriate for people whose job is to comment on the news, to, to political news, to be chummy with politicians. So when people say to me things like, oh, you're a big uh, Keir Starmer fan, aren't you? I, I kind of go, well, listen, I'm optimistic about the future, but I have no personal relationship with the man. I've interviewed him on stage, uh, but... Uh, you know, I spent pretty much the same amount of time with him as you did if you were sitting in the audience or if you've listened to the podcast. I don't think that we should do that. And and it may put me... It may Listen, I may be wrong. Yeah, Sadiq Khan comes into the studio once a month. I'm doing a gig with him on Thursday night, um, which I agreed to before I checked the football schedule. But, the, the, but there'll be no socialising. We won't go out for dinner afterwards. We won't go for a drink before or afterwards. And almost everybody else does it differently. And that's fine. But I think it's wrong. I don't think we should socialise with politicians because when the time comes to give them a kicking, I don't think you'll kick them as hard if you have got a little bit of history together, a little bit of legacy. And there's no point us being here if we are not prepared to kick them as hard as possible as and when they deserve it. I just, I just thought that, that that was quite important to stress because the conversation I'm going to have next hinges upon some contact that I have with somebody who works or has worked in the past on on big campaigns, on general election campaigns, and, and is quite close even now, even though they're out of the game, quite still quite close to, to the Labour high command. And they tell me that there is still no love for Keir Starmer on the doorsteps. This is the, the, the line I received earlier this morning. There is still no love for Keir Starmer on the doorsteps. The ground campaign is not actually that good. It hasn't had time to recover and improve after the mess that the um, uh, constituency-based campaigning was left in by Corbyn's period in charge. We've lost the ability to communicate with swing voters at a local level because the Corbynista members only wanted to campaign among the core vote and the non-voting dispossessed. So local activists have spent many years recently chasing the mad left out of local parties instead of campaigning towards voters. And that means that nationally the party has actually had a much steeper mountain to climb than you might have expected. Um, it's only latterly been able to turn its attentions to localised campaigning. Um, and I hadn't thought of it that way around. But a crucial part or a crucial consequence of the problems described there is Keir Starmer. There's not a lot of love for Keir Starmer on the doorstep. Now, the obvious question for me to ask in response to that claim, which I think is probably true, is why? Why do you think there is not a lot of love for Keir Starmer on the doorstep? But of course, the best way to answer that question is is to talk about yourself. So you may be drawn towards some of the policies. You may just be desperate for a change, working on the principle that a change is as good as a rest. You may... Um, simply think that after 14 years and the, sub and, and, and the various disasters that we've endured, then a vote for the only person other than Rishi Sunak with a realistic chance of becoming a prime minister is, is a no-brainer. But I, I 
would have thought, given the poll leads, you would have thought... And listen, Keir Starmer's personal polling is going up, but there's not a lot of love for him on the doorstep. And I want you to tell me why you think that is. Hit the, hit the numbers now. You will get through. And remember, this is a, a grown-up programme, so some of the reasons we come up with for why there's not a lot of love for Keir Starmer on the doorstep may actually cast Keir Starmer in a positive light. The thing about personal approval ratings is that the most popular politician is often the most disliked. The most liked politician is often the most disliked because people like being lied to. People like being made promises that can't be kept. People love having their own prejudices and bigotries endorsed and amplified by public figures. Donald Trump's entire political popularity is based on well, essentially, a blend of authoritarianism and racism. So people who like authoritarianism and racism hate um, uh, democracy in its current form. They hate election results. They love Donald Trump. We've got our own little pound shop versions here. And you'll see in the personal popularity polling that the most liked politicians are often the most disliked. People say that they're like Marmite, but that's an unhelpful phrase because Marmite doesn't turn up at your breakfast table promising you that if you could just get rid of all the foreigners, you'll be rich by tea time. And Marmite doesn't lie to you. So when people talk about Marmite politicians, they're missing the point that liars prosper because people like like the lies. So Starmer and to a lesser extent Sunak are never going to be those kind of politicians. Johnson was probably a good example of someone. I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head. Um, Johnson was probably a good example of someone who um, who fits that category, would have been had quite high like ratings and quite high dislike ratings at the same time. Because if you like the lies that he peddled, you'd like him. And if you can see through the lies that he peddled, you wouldn't like him. But but what um what explains for you the lack of well we'll use the word love or or high levels of enthusiasm for Keir Starmer personally. 0345 6060 973. And remember, it has to be an answer that accommodates the size of the poll lead. So, uh, although I want personal answers to the question, I don't want them to be too personal. I don't like him because yada, yada, yada. You, you, you have to explain how the popularity in the polls for the party that he leads is, well, the Tories are looking at the lowest poll ratings that have ever been um cited since polling began and some of the responsibility for that has to be down to the labor party so the popularity of labor in the polls is is off the charts the lead now is extraordinary but keir starmer himself doesn't yet inspire any particularly high levels of personal enthusiasm. And I, and I want to know why you think that is. I also want to know about the journey that you've been on, whether or not you're, you're, you're warming to the man, whether or not you, you did find him overly cautious. You did find him um, a, a little bit nervous, perhaps, a, a little bit dull. And now, as Election Day looms ever closer, you are um, uh, increasingly positive in your outlook to him, or the other way, of course. Uh, you could have started off in a much warmer place than you are now. So why have your personal opinions, feelings now rather than facts, why have your personal feelings about Keir Starmer changed, 03456060973, or the broader big picture question of, of why the poll lead is absolutely massive, but the personal popularity is not Okay, it's 11.17. James O'Brien on LBC. And the other side of that, of course, is it's hard to imagine somebody very strongly disliking him. Uh, maybe you can't have one without the other. Maybe you will always be a politician if you've got high liking ratings. You're going to have high disliking ratings. Um, and if you're not someone that is easy to get passionately supportive of, then you're not someone who it's easy to hate either i don't know i'm, I'm, I'm just just thinking out loud oh uh, three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number you need james is in thornhill james what, what do you think what would you like to say um, I, i'm not in love with Keir, but i i don't hate him either i think he's just he's not offering enough for people of my generation i've i'm 37 i'm not i'm, I'm not I, sorry i'm not looking at the policy offer I, I, don't, yeah. I don't want to sound like silly, but I'm not looking at the policy offer because the poll lead is so huge. 
So we, we could all sit here and say, I wish he was doing more for me personally. But what is it about his personality or what is it about his performance rather than his policy offer? That Because the popularity of the party is defined in the opinion polls. The popularity of the man is way behind the popularity of the party. So it's not a question you can answer by talking about there's not enough on offer for people like you. Well, that's true for me. Yeah but, you wouldn't, so, yeah, but you'd like the policy offer more. The man would be exactly the same if they changed the policy. So what is it about the man that explains the ratings? I, I think he's just a bit bland, to be honest. He, yeah. I don't know. It keeps coming up. What does he stand for? What is he going to actually do when he's given the levers of power? He's looking at a huge majority. What's he going to do with that? That's the... That's the question for me. Right. What What is this man going to do for the country? But the mate? manifesto was... I mean, there was quite a lot in it, James. Yeah, the, it's... The manifesto is very cautious. Yeah, there's, there's, so then what, there's an answer to your question, then. He's going to be cautious, and that, that probably is a good thing, isn't it, after the 14 years that we've just have had... Well, I would argue not. No, no. I, okay. I, I think it, it's tinkering around the edges, and and I'm looking for something that's going to really kickstart this country and and do something for us. I think this is why you're seeing more people, um, you know, sort of begrudgingly voting Labour, but also people looking at parties like Reform worryingly. But we saw yesterday. I mean, they're not even pretending that they're claims are costed yeah ex exactly and so that, that's, this that's is, this is, i think you've nailed it in a way because starmer is dull uh, you know the, the 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 manifesto explains how they think they will raise eight billion pounds that they want to build three hundred thousand houses a year which i think is a tory pledge as well or the tory pledge might be slightly higher it, it, but if you're going to show you're working and they've all been they've both been criticized mm. for for not necessarily having proved that their workings will work if you're going to show you're working then you're going to be dull if you're going to promise people the earth without having to explain where the money is going to come from then you can be exciting so uh, you want someone more exciting but exciting i think this is why i referenced the last 14 years exciting usually means fantasy and <clears throat> I, I would like to see something akin to the ambition that we've seen after the Second World War. So I think that's the crisis mm, we are facing. We're facing people who struggle between heating and eating. You yeah. know, th this is real life. You, I see it on your program day yeah. after day. People are really struggling. I do a fairly middle-class, well-paid job, and I'm struggling, and I see people in my community struggling. And I think... We want to see ambition. And I think some, a lot of people I speak to will vote Labour, but begrudgingly. Yeah, I think no, people very well, almost cautiously. will get tired of it very quickly. Unless he delivers. And, and I don't know that you've heard from him an acknowledgement of some of the, the, the stuff that you're referring to. The story yesterday about teachers and doctors having to step in where once the, 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 the state structure would have helped, the damage that austerity has done to the country. He talks about it. But I suppose if I were defending him from these accusations, you'll say he was not going to promise you things that he can't deliver. Even if he knows how desperately you want them, he's not going to promise them to you if he, if he, can't, if he knows he can't deliver because that way he's going to have an even bigger hangover when he gets into Downing Street than, than he is as a consequence of the caution you describe or the begrudging votes that you describe. Thank you, James. Um, God, three James in a row. So I'm James, he's James, and Jamie is in Colchester. Jamie, what would you like to say? What an echo Hi, chamber. What an echo chamber this is. Everyone's got the same bloody name, never mind the same politics. What would you like to say, Jamie? Hi, Hi James. Uh, first time caller to your show. Welcome. Uh, long time listener. Thank you. Um, I, I think part of the problem, present company accepted, is, is the way the media looks for the gotcha moment and the soundbite clip kind yeah. of mentality of, of kind of the, what, the, the way that media is interviews like people like Keir Starmer. Yes. So a good example would be today, um, Nick Ferrari's interview, which I listened to in full. Mm. Um, and you had questions on there which, where you're almost de they're desperate to pin him to the wall on something. And when he gives an answer, which I think is personally reasonable, so, for example, the question around tax and yeah. him saying we're, we're not planning to raise taxes 
on working people. I, you can get bogged down on what working people means. Sure. But people are saying, so you're going to raise I, this I, I tax. Quite liked raise his answer. Tax. I quite liked his answer to that question about what working people mean. The, the, well, the, 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 the definition of people who are working, but who could be really upended by a, a big unexpected expense. It's, it's something we've talked about a lot on the program. About, But yeah. anyway, sorry, I mean, that's not the point you're making. No, and, and, and you, you are right. I think that, that that speaks to a lot of people in mm. society. But I think the issue is, because he then wouldn't commit to, you know, five years' worth of budgets and being able to write, write a, a tax budget and commitment for five years, not knowing what's going to happen in the world. Yes. The, the headline now on LBC's website is, Starmer refuses to rule out council tax rises. And so, so it's the headline on the BBC website as well. Uh, but yeah, that, yeah, that well, just proves was, your point even more, doesn't it? Yeah, that, that we... And so if that's the only consumption of... Um, politics that you get for that day is this headline or this clip but this is this is true of all politicians i mean this is how this is how it works and and i i, I know you're not singling nick out for particular criticism on this um no. I, you'd be perfectly entitled to if you wanted to but just for the record you're not um that, that's how they measure the success of an interview like that and i say they not we because i, I don't I, I and and that there's a reason why the rest of the media does you, you judge the success of an interview like that by the headlines that it generates, not yeah. by the quality of the hour of radio that, that, that you're making. And that, that is just the way it works. That is just the system that we inhabit. But as a result, despite maybe liking Labour's policies and Labour's yeah. manifestos, he looks evasive. Yeah. And, you know, he, he wouldn't, you know, come up with a, a, a response to the two-state solution, you know, something which has been a geopolitical hot potato for, for 70 years. He was expected to in a moment, come up with a, a solution on land division, you know, and you just think, <laughs> you know, look, if, you're, if you're expecting... Well, where would to, the border be? Well, exactly, you no. know, and, and no one's going to give a conclusive answer in that second, but if that's the clip you see, you think, oh, Starmer's evasive, and he's just like every other politician, won't answer a question. And, but, you know, there's a good reason why he didn't, you know. But is he more susceptible to this than other politicians? I think at the moment he is because he's trying to be as honest and upfront as possible and not. And I think it goes back to what you said. You can promise the world if you know you're never going to have to actually put it into place. Or even if, if you're Boris Johnson, even if you know you are going to have to put it into place, you'll just yeah. pretend that you never said that stuff. I mean, literally, you'll pretend you never said things like there'll be no border in the Irish Sea when you get into Downing yeah. or when you get into, into the bigger job. Whereas he knows he's, he, you know, barring some amazing reversal in the polls, he is going to be enacting at, at his pledges. And so he knows that he will be more accountable to what he says than everyone else. So he's not over promising. And I, I, I personally would be rather someone under promised and over delivered than the other way around because I had 14 years of, of promises and, and very little on the delivery side of things. Yeah. So I think. I, I, so we're turning it. Why. Are we turning it, this lack of personal popularity into a positive then in the course of this conversation? Well, I mean, I, 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 the more I see of him, the more I think, do you know what? Like, I, I have, I'm sort of fed up of bombastic politicians that yeah. say they're going to change the world and, and do very little positive. And yes, it can come across as dull and uninspiring, but actually, I'm one of the the losers who's read the manifesto page to page and actually think <laughs> that there's some really positive stuff. And if you read between the lines, there's some quite transformational stuff in yes. there. Um, yes, which so I some, of Rachel really Reeves's, some of Rachel Reeves' ideas. In, yeah. in, in particular. So you'll be listening tomorrow to Rishi Sunak in the same chair, in the same spot? Uh, uh, yeah, I will. I'll put myself through that. And he, um, he possibly, uh, certainly when he was competing against Liz Truss, some of the things that you've just said about Keir Starmer could have applied to Rishi Sunak, less so since, yeah. but, but certainly on her economic plans, he, 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 he was doing the, whatever the antidote is to fantasy politics. He, he was doing that. So it'll be interesting to hear how he gets on. In, in, in yeah. the same sort of context, in the same uh, And if framework. you can get through five minutes without mentioning the £2,000 tax uh, rising, that'll be... Because that really undoes it all, doesn't it? That, that, yeah, that, absolutely. In a way, that's, that's Brexit. That's Michael yeah. Gove saying we should keep hitting the £2,000 tax claim because look how well the £350 million lie on the side of the bus worked. Yeah. And that's not Starmer. Starmer isn't doing that sort of thing, for, I mean, for good or for ill. Charisma, a lot, lot of love for you coming in, Jamie, actually. Yeah, like Jamie said, says Kirsty. Debbie says, Jamie's a brilliant caller. So unless you've got like several burner phones on the go and you're pinging praise for yourself into the programme, which I can't criticise you for, that would be a bit pot kettle. 
um then you, you, you yeah and i like that that, that there is some and this and this isn't a criticism of people if i was interviewing politicians i wouldn't get headlines i think i'd make really good radio and you'd learn a lot about the politician in the studio but i wouldn't be trying to sort of trip them up on the price of a loaf of bread or something like that because i want to know more about the person in front of me which is why i love doing full disclosure but full disclosure never makes headlines or very very rarely um, and, and that's not a criticism of the system in which other journalists operate. That, that, that is what they have to do. The success of that interview with Keir Starmer this morning in most quarters of this building will be judged by the amount of headlines that it's generated. And, uh, and the headlines are essentially Starmer pushed on council tax and private schools. Half past 11 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. Only three minutes after 11 is the time. I, I, so I, I think, I'm talking to Natasha earlier about this slight mythology that's built up around how popular Tony Blair was in 97 on a personal level. Um, why was Nick Clegg so popular in 2010? Someone just texted me and said, remember Clegg mania? Was he? Did, I mean, were his personal numbers? They were, weren't they? And so, so some of the constructive criticism of Keir Starmer that's coming in, i.e. answers to the question of um, why is he not more personally popular, saying he's not very funny. He, he is quite funny, actually, but he's not a great deliverer of, of gags. He sometimes swallows a word or something like that in, 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 in PMQs. But I don't remember Nick Clegg as being a particularly... I know the bloke who trained Nick Clegg for those debates, actually. And... Uh, and he did perform brilliantly in those debates. But I can't remember why. I can't remember what it was. I just remember everyone else saying, Gordon Brown and David Cameron kept saying, I agree with Nick. That's such a win in those contexts. So he was obviously reaching parts that Keir Starmer hasn't managed to reach. The first TV debate, a couple of you have just said, Tom, most recently, apparently in the first TV debate, Nick Clegg really stretched his legs. Um and, uh, and and I can't quite, I can't, you know, I can't quite remember that. A lot of people, says Richard, see him as being shifty because he appears to have switched his opinion so often. I think that's unfair, but people on the left and right both have that opinion. Perhaps that explains his lack of personal popularity. It's weird, though, isn't it? Because, you know, you, you've got some politicians who don't just shift their position. They sort of wash their hands of their own creations, most obviously with Brexit. And, and the people who fell for their lies the first time around still like them. Um, I, I don't think Clegg's popularity was built on the promise to get rid of student fees, but it's certainly the hemorrhaging of popularity was built upon the... Um, the failure to do so or the betrayal of that promise. 11.35 is the time. Elizabeth is in East Grinstead. Elizabeth, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, James. Hello. Gosh, I think it's just the first time I've ever spoken to you. My heart rate's gone up way well, too. So has so mine. So has mine, Elizabeth. This is outrageous. <laughs> well, we better leave this to ourselves. Then, Carry on. <laughs> the reason that I'm phoning you is because I think I, I get the, the reason that Keir Starmer doesn't come across as so popular with people because I because I chat to my friends and people yes. I know, and it's emotional, because I'm part of the 49%. Yes, 48. And we are... An, uh, 48, yeah, sorry. That's all right. It's, it's probably a lot more than that now, but it was it's 48. It's that heart rate of mine yeah, that's no. going, that's what did that. <laughs> but it. it's, the, it's, the, it's the feeling that we have had nobody, nobody mm. to shout for us. Mm. Nobody. And Keir Starmer comes across as passive, okay. as, do, as do everybody. Now, maybe that's my error in thinking, hey, I've got to accept this. It's happened. We lost. But emotionally, we're still immensely angry because we see the damage it's doing. The wrecking of our country. I've got family all over the world. and They are laughing at our country. And it's it's not nice. The last time I was proud of our country was the Olympics. So we're back to we're really back hurts. to we're back to Brexit, and and rightly so. Oh, Brexit, absolutely Brexit, yeah. absolutely Brexit. Because, because you you feel the need to us. you feel the need to have a champion in in, in on the main to... stage of British politics, and you know exactly. the Liberal Democrats, the Greens, the SNP, Plaid Cymru, they, they they're not um, in a position to. To, to make you feel represented for, 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 nope. for, for whatever I've reason been, it may I'm, be. I've been homeless. 
I felt oh, homeless goodness. politically for the part. I'm not I'm going to vote Labour. You're not. No, I won't. I'm going to vote tactically. Okay. As I as I encourage everybody to do. I'm car- I'm following Carol Vorderman's site. I'm going to. Okay, I don't say anything else, otherwise I'll have to read out a whole list oh, sorry, of candidates. A whole lot. Sorry. No, that no, that's but fine. What I mean that's, is, that's absolutely what I fine. Mean is, no, what I mean is, I want the Tories out. Yeah, but. So does Keir Starmer, which is why I he's not. He does, but, which is but, why what I mean is, I'm going to do what I can to make sure he gets in. Let's but, put it that yeah, way. Yeah, but that that is also why he's not done the things that you want him to do because he I is he's prioritising winning over what you want. I know. So in I a know, way, he is what, doing what you want. He can't win with you, can he? He's daft, damned if he doesn't, damned no, if he doesn't. What I'm, no, what I'm explaining is why we don't, why me and my friends who are, you know, feel the way we do because yeah, yeah. we've still okay. got nobody to shout. All we've got... Is me. And I'm not, I don't... Yeah. <laughs> I've listened to you for donkey's years, honestly. And <laughs> if it wasn't for you, and dare I say Nick... Yes, of course. And uh, Steve Bray and... Graham Hughes, who I never hear. I don't know. I don't. Much. I don't know that Nick, Nick Ferrari. No, no, Nick Abbott. Oh, I was going to say, I'm not sure Nick Ferrari has quite succeeded in casting himself no. as, a, <laughs> as, a, as an enemy of Brexit yet. Although I'm sure he's going to have a go. No, no, no. I was trying not to do the cliche things that everybody says. No, fair enough. But you're, yeah, no. you're right. There aren't many places in the media where where can I go? The madness of Brexit has been called out, and there's very few places in mainstream politics. I saw, and 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 these baby steps that he's taking today are nowhere near enough to satisfy. To paraphrase Bedell and Skinner and the Lightning Seeds, to, to to satisfy the eight years of hurt that you uh, that you you've been living with, I, I think that's a really good point. You you would feel passionate about Keir Starmer if he was the king of the Remainers, but he wouldn't be twenty points ahead in the polls if it. So you know, it, it's what I say. It's 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 damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. But thank you for your honesty. Elsie says I agree with this caller totally. I personally like Keir Starmer, but I was so wishing he'd be much stronger on Brexit. I still have tiny hopes, but it's fading. Well, you need to use Global Player to listen to the first hour of the programme, Elsie, on what is and what is not plausible. Um, And Andy says, all politicians are unpopular. Some are more unpopular than others. And I think my theory is borne out by the statistics that the ones who do quite well on likability ratings are usually the most disliked as well. Um, Make of that what you will. Chris is in Hanwell. Chris, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Good afternoon. Hello. And I just want to preface, preface this with saying that I'm a lifelong, or have been a lifelong Tory voter. Okay. Um, but in the last two years, I have changed my mind on Keir Starmer oh. and the Labour Party. And uh, so I've done a 180 degree turn. And it all comes back to a little bit of Brexit, yeah. but mainly Boris. Right. The party gate. And certainly... But, the, so you voted folks, for him in 2019, or you voted yes. for his party in 2019? Without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah. But I will never forget that photo of the Queen alone at her husband's funeral while they were partying in Downing Street. And it was at that moment then, even as a guy who would love to go to the pub with Boris and have a chat with him, sure, completely turned against him then. We'll never forgive him for that. And then after him, we had the nightmare of trust. Yeah. Now, I'm a big fan of Keir Starmer because what we need are boring politicians to do the boring jobs that nobody wants to do. We do not need any more personalities like that right now. We've got a massive mess to sort out after Brexit. It's going to take years before we're in a position to even look at rejoining the EU or the common market. And I think that Keir is fantastic at that. He is such a great guy for that job. I, I mean, some people will think that you're being economical with the actuality, or the, or the because because the scale of your transformation is so is so great. They might think that you're exaggerating, or or, or um, uh, you know, ringing in to to, to 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 muddy the waters or que- queer the pitch. I I don't think you are, and I just think you're rare. I think yeah, that I think see. that to go from disillusionment with Johnson to well, to, to reach disillusionment with Johnson, to go from voting to John, for Johnson to disillusionment on an epic scale is absolutely plausible, entirely plausible. I would argue probably the only rational response to, to the man and, and what he is and what he did. But to go from disillusionment with Johnson to great enthusiasm for Starmer is not a journey that many people have been on with you. Uh, well, let's see how bad this election result is for the Tories. Yeah. It's not just going to be bad. It's not just going to be a landslide. It's going to be like the... As, as things stand, it's, a, it's an friends. existential people threat. people like me... Yes. If people like me yeah. can vote Labour, 
and start liking Kia, then anybody who was on the, the fringes could, because I was definitely not on the fringe. I was a, a fully paid up member Boris of the cons- guy. Yeah. I, I, and, and it is the personalities in many ways and, and the consequences <laughs> of promoting those personalities that has that has changed. I, I think you're making a lot of sense, actually. And, 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 and part of my question is built upon, in a way, the, the idea of, of why more people haven't, haven't done what you have done. Although, as with earlier callers, I'm getting a lot of like, it's like having a red button. Caroline says, exactly. Boring, sensible, reliable politicians. Yes, please. Stephen says, totally agree with this guy. Boom. Um, that, that's exactly, we need to move away from the culture of the, of the maverick character. And, and um, I guess in some ways, Johnson was the apotheosis of the maverick character and you saw what you got when you fell for that kind of shtick. Um, of course, you've still got Farage um, on, on the, on the uh, extremity of the right wing appealing to people who haven't had enough of maverick characters. Thank you, Chris. Do you, but while you're here, do, do you ever go to the Fox? Yes, sir. Do you ever go to the Fox in Hanwell? I do indeed. The food... That is a lovely pub. That's yeah, right. That's the food a... has gone slightly downhill, sir, but... The oh, well, there goes fantastic. my free pint. I, there, there goes my free pint next time I wander in. You're uh, dissing the chef. It's uh, it's 11.44, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Lucy's in Saffron Walden. Lucy, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Hello. Um, hi. So, I was never very political, but just recently I realised that I have a bit of a passion. Okay. Um, what happened? What uh, changed? Um, I became a, a little business owner, so yeah. I had to go self-employed due to family situation, yes. um, flexi hours and stuff. And, and I think when you do something like that, you, you become more aware of who you're paying your tax and all the different things you have to do with the government. And stuff. Oh, how interesting. how interesting. But it, it's, it's, it's a strange one, really, because, um, it just happened, uh, over the last two years. Um, yeah. and I started to watch PMQs and, and I found you on a podcast and then found you on live and okay. and that sort of thing. And then it's got trotting along and basically <laughs> I look at the person. I look at the person. So every time I see Rishi and PMQs or whatever, I just found myself saying in the back of my head, he's a bit petulant. Yeah. Or he's a bit catty. <laughs> and I used to, you know, thinking, cool, look at these, you know, it was a yes. bit like, you know, a bit like a drama. And then here would talk and I thought, well, he's not. He's not very catchy. He he doesn't come back with many quid. And I s- thought to myself, is that good? Mm. And then I thought, well, actually, for me as a person, as an individual, a mum, my own cleaning business, fairly basic stuff. Sure. He he isn't. He isn't catty, and he, he isn't petulant. And this morning, he was asked what he respected about Rishi. Yeah. Did he res- no? Did he respect anything about Rishi? I think Nick said something like that. Yeah, it was a great and question. Said, a really good. It question. was a great question because mm. Kia couldn't. He didn't have to say anything kind. No. He didn't have to say anything at all. He could have been. And I'm waiting to see what Rishi says about him tomorrow. Yeah. Um, about um, Kia, so Kia, obviously, but sure. he said on his first day it was really really busy, and he, he still took to the time. That. Yeah, he didn't have to ring me and say, whatever we, you know, battle we have in the forest, me and you will talk on defence. We will stay close on the things that really matter. And he actually was really grateful for that. You yeah. could tell in his voice. I don't think he put that on. I think that was really something so he admired. Do you know what that is? That's such a great thing that you've picked up on. Because that actually goes back to the conversation we were having about the very nature of interviewing with a, with an earlier caller. Because I thought that was by far the most powerful part of the interview. But yeah, you're never going to but you're never going to get a headline out of that, are you? No. So that that was what no. the other caller was saying about zingers and and Starmer comes across as evasive because all journalists are constantly trying to pin him down. But actually, yeah. you learnt more about the man probably in that moment than you did in a million conversations about private schools, council tax, and Gaza. It did. And when he talked about his lad doing his GCSEs and just finishing and stuff, I actually felt really, look, I don't I don't know how great he's going to be or anything like that. But all I do know is I kind of felt his family situation then. Your child, child didn't, you know, we need one parent around because yeah. the other one's super busy. And, and I just felt, even though Rishi talks about his family, it feels different. So what we it what we don't want different. we don't want a, a kind of performing seal, do we? We we, we well, want then, someone who feels no, a little bit like us. I think and think for me around me and my family and things and, and friends and people in the community. The more extreme somebody is, the more exciting they are. But for me, the more extreme someone is, 
the, the more afraid I am. So yes. I see Kia as, as a safe, comfortable sofa that I know feels safe to sit on. It's not going to break. I, I think, you've, you've, well, I get, as I mentioned earlier, I'm getting a lot of compliments for, for callers today, and, and, and you've, got, you've got a hat full as well. So what a sensible caller. Um, I, I, and what you describe, I, it's, I'm always wary, and it's only women that do this, Lucy. I don't know whether you've noticed when people come on the show and automatically or, or sort of denigrate their own qualifications to comment, because you've demonstrated a higher level of engagement on a personal level with the politics of the moment than at least as much as anybody else has today. You, you're fully sort of um, immersed in it now, aren't you? I, be I believe in him, and if I had got to ask him a question, which I, I didn't ring up to ask a question because I felt it wasn't the right one for today or anything, okay. but I wanted to ask, I'm starting to really believe in you as a right. person. Yes. Please don't please don't let me down. And it's just such a funny thing to say. Because <laughs> he's going to say, oh, of course, Lucy, I won't let you down. But I actually like the front bench, uh, the top bench as well, um, yeah. the, the front bench. I like the people on it, and I liked them before him. So my That's journey's really been a kind of progressive because I really like Wes and I think Wes is, my husband's in the NHS and works six days a week right. trying to help people and I, and I think that Wes is the right one for us. So, I, yeah. uh, my, 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 I lost a friend in lockdown um, and, and when I was preparing the eulogy I had to speak to some of his former colleagues and I didn't know that side of his life. I, I'd never worked with him or anything like that. And they all said mm. the same catchphrase that he had, which he'd say to them, even if they were about, because he was their boss, and he'd be, they'd be about to like do a really important presentation or they were about to go and present to the board or something like that. And all he ever said to them, I can't say one of these words on the radio, but you can work out what it was. He just, <laughs> used, to, he just used to say to them, Lucy, and he'd look at them very seriously. He'd look them in the eye and he'd say, don't F it up. And that's, that's what you're saying to Keir Starmer, I think. I just really want him to look after our country and keep it safe. I think the country needs some arms around it, some big arms around it, and it needs someone to say, look, we don't need to be embarrassed anymore. We don't need to be humiliated about what's happened and, you know, ashamed to, to say I'm mm -hmm. from Great Britain or whatever. And, and mm -hmm. I think the only person who can lead us out of that, and it may, oh God, I've got goosebumps, the only thing, <laughs> all over, the only thing it could, he only person I see that can do it is him. He's not perfect. I'm not saying that. No, I, but, well, I, 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 thank you. I'm so glad you were listening today, and I'm so glad you rang in. I, I'll read you some of the comments coming in. Sarah says, "Great caller." Ash says, "This lady sounds wonderful." Um, uh, another Sarah says, "She's genuine. She's not tribal or tainted, and her views seem raw." I love this caller, says Lisa. Uh, so, um, well done. <laughs> That's lovely. Thank you, Lucy. Crikey, it's ten to twelve. James O'Brien on LBC. It's six minutes to 12. It, it may not be a phone-in, the, the thing we were thinking of doing after 12 o'clock, which is why are so many Nazi and fascist sympathisers attracted to whatever party Nigel Farage is currently leading? They lost 100 candidates between January and April. They've had two Hitler fans in the last week and 41 people who were friends on Facebook with the leader of a kind of Oswald Mosley tribute act, a, a modern fascist movement. Farage, as ever, lies about it and claims that they've just shared material or that there are only one or two candidates because I don't imagine he wants to answer the question of, of why so many fascist and Nazi sympathisers are attracted to him personally, because uh, he, he seems to be the only recurring feature of these, these various parties, although Reform technically is, of course, a limited company of which he is the majority shareholder. So if the buck doesn't stop with the with the uh, chief executive and majority shareholder of a limited company. Who the hell does it stop with? I wonder who they'll be trying to blame the latest um, Hitler fan on uh, in the course of today. But it, I, as a phone-in, I just don't know. And, and a lot of you preferred that to the private education phone-in. But I, I, don't, I don't know. I think the answer might be a bit obvious. And we, we can't spend a whole hour repeating ourselves, can we? So I, as things stand... Um, I might move the conversation towards why the, the private education conversation is so febrile in this country but when it affects such a small number of people. There's also quite a good story that you had warned me about, and I've now seen some evidence of it. Um, a, a chat called Danny. I've lost your text. I'll try and find it during, during the news. But um, I've now seen some evidence of what Danny described while telling me that as an admissions officer at a state school, they're not having any expressions of interest from, from parents who were worried about not being able to uh, uh, afford the school fees when the VAT thing kicks in. Back to Keir Starmer. Lisa is in Islington. Lisa, what would you like to say? 
Hi, Kim. Hello. Kia. Oh, that's um, a Freudian slip. I'm James. Sorry. That's Hi, all right. James. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. I just had it in my head of what I was going to say, so I'm a bit nervous. Fair enough. Um, my, my thing is, I, I just don't trust him. And okay. look, I, I'm kind of between my head and my heart here because um, looking at his CV and all the stuff he's done before, before he became a leader of the Labour Party, I, I, I could have, yeah. That, that's the kind of Keir Starmer that I would kind of be more likely to trust. Mm. However, I, I, with my head, I get it. I get why he's had to do what he's had to do. I get why he's had to move a bit more to the centre. I get why he's got to sort of appeal to a certain type of voters. But that's, again, the same reason why I don't trust it, because mm. there's been a different formation of who he has become. He's kind of changed. It's like, yes, he's changed the party, but also he feels like he's changed as well. I also don't really feel comfortable about his stance on Gaza, and I don't feel comfortable about um, the way the whole Diane Abbott thing was kind of handled, yeah. regardless of whether he had something directly or indirectly to do with it. It did feel like he kind of left her to be thrown to the wolves, and there was no kind of support for her, regardless of the fact, you know... What, no, what even, she I mean, even if we just confine it to that day in Parliament when she wanted to contribute to a debate that was yep. essentially about her. And yep. and uh, although Starmer's not the speaker, he could certainly have expressed support in a way that he that he failed to do. Uh, trust is a different thing, though. So what, what, what yeah, are the I big mean, what are the big pivots or switches that, that, that you base that on? I, I think, uh, for me personally, it, it would be the two things, that the Gaza stance and the... And, well, and, he's, and I mean, Dynabbas better late than it, never it, on G Gaza, calling for an immediate ceasefire. That's pretty unequivocal. Yes, but it kind of feels like his, his, his hand was kind of like he, he sort of had to do it. It felt like it felt like the backlash was the reason. It didn't. Okay. He should have said that. He should have said that immediately. But as as someone who's dealt with being a humanitarian type lawyer, yeah, that should, that should come straight from him. Like like, and I, I told again, I get it with everything that happened with the Labour Party before and Corbyn and all that kind of stuff. I get it. I get it. I get why I had to be really careful. You're, with you're, it. You're, 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 it. No, this is a really important position because all of the things that he has done in pursuit of power involve mm. prioritization and you're uncomfortable yep. with his with the ease with which he apparently prioritizes yep. as opposed to some points that you'd think he would stick to come hell or high water it's, and then what does that mean for when he's in office for it when might he make him less electable power. but but it also for you makes him less trustworthy in in in, in the context of power what what won't he step back from if the weather changes it Exactly. And yeah. if I do for him, you know, it will be with my nose closed. I'm not going to lie. Um, my parents were huge fans of Blair. Right. And, uh, you know, my immigrants, my parents, you know, they've been here for 20 odd years. I'd say my dad's in the retired doctor. Mum worked in social care. Um, I'd say, you know, of that kind of sort, they were huge Tony Blair fans okay. and they don't like I don't him. know how uh -huh. many, no, well, I mean, there you go. Maybe a little bit of, of historical revisionism, but I find it easier to believe in the concept of a huge Tony Blair fan than I do in the concept of a huge Keir Starmer fan, which speaks, I think, to the point that you're making. Uh, remember that if you're not registered, not you, Lisa, I'm sure you are, but if, if anyone is not registered to vote, then they won't be able to cast a vote on uh, two, two weeks on Thursday, 2.1 million people have applied to register since the election was called on the 22nd of May um, of this year. But the, but the research shows that the people least likely to be registered are from the 18 to 24 cohort and from the least well-off sections of our society who arguably have got the most at stake in any general election. So do go to um, gov.co, no, gov.uk, all right, gov.uk slash register hyphen to hyphen vote. Um, uh, if you're going to be over 18 on May the 4th, uh, on July the 4th even, then that is where you need to be going now. So um, as we head towards the news, you can head towards your computer. You can be signed up. You can be done and dusted in five minutes flat. It can all be done online. All you need is your name, your address, and your national insurance number, which, frankly, you should know by heart. Um, the deadline is midnight tonight, so you've got exactly 12 hours to do it.
James O'Brien on LBC. It's four minutes after 12. Have a little listen to this. A slightly longer version of Keir Starmer talking about private education earlier on LBC. And see if you can spot the thing. And, and send me a little message while you're listening, if you do. There's something in this clip that I don't think could happen in any country other than England. There's so, so something he says that is so self-evidently true that you need someone to point out to you that it's also revolutionary. The, the, the discourse surrounding private education in this country has always hinged upon a really insidious presumption, the claim that you've always heard about parents who do what my parents did and what I do when they privately educate their children are, are somehow... Well, anyway, I won't, I won't oversell it, but just have a listen to this and see if you can spot what we spotted, because it is... I think it's hugely illustrative. Mike in Berkshire, I'm in a region, I'm in a marginal Berkshire seat. I've given up on the Tories. I would be minded to give Labour a chance, but I seem to be one of those people the Labour have chosen to despise. I'm a moderately successful aspirational parent who's elected to choose private education. VAT at 20% feels like a super tax on me. He is not alone. The head teacher of the school that your wife attended says this will cause significant disruption for children forced to leave school but we're even more concerned about the capacity of local schools. The head of the school that you attended, Rygate Grammar, says this will inevitably lead to thousands of children going to already oversubscribed state schools. How come you know better than all these teachers? Well, Nick, I, 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 firstly, um, I've got nothing against private schools, and I do understand that many parents save hard and work hard to send their children to private schools because they have real aspiration for them. But I also understand... Um, that all parents have aspiration for their children, including parents who send their children to uh, a state school. And I want to make sure that every single child, wherever they come from, whatever their background, has the opportunity to get on in life um, and that feels that success belongs okay. to them. It's a tough choice. There isn't a lot of money Let, around, let's have but it's a, it's a choice we've made to Let, ensure that we have the teachers we need in our state secondary schools. Final it's word. a tough choice. Yeah, you're good. I, well, I, you're absolutely right. It was aspiration. That line there about all parents have aspiration for their children. How can that be a revolutionary thing to say? Or, or, or it sounded new when he said it. I, I've done this. I, I mean, I think that when I used to defend private education, well, I was a very interesting child, as you could well imagine, in that I would be at private school often debating for the abolition of private schools in, in good faith. But the I still subscribe to the idea that my parents had more aspiration for me than your parents did if you didn't go to private school. Obviously, money's part of it. Money's all of it. If So you take two families with identical financial situations, right, one of whom prioritises private education and one doesn't. Does that parent have more aspiration for their child than the other one? Are you sure? Because you could afford it, but you're not sending your child there. You are prioritising a BMW or a, or a fancy holiday or a, or a cottage in the Cotswolds. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So, but, but it's always struck me as obnoxious, actually, for the private education parents to have almost monopolised that word aspiration. Um, so, well, I say it always. Obviously, it didn't when I was much younger. But, but that, that's why I liked that... Uh, intervention today i like the idea of of him simply saying can we stop talking about my policy being an attack upon parents who have aspiration for their children because all parents have aspiration for their children so this came in from danny at 11 o'clock this morning when we were talking about this um, bit of the interview with natasha hi james i manage a local authority school admissions service so that is about as close to the action as you can get. Now listen to this. It says, we've had next to no communication from parents suggesting that they're going to be flooding back to our state schools. Although we have been tipped off about groups in private schools putting in fake applications to cause pressure. Capacity is an issue in secondary schools, but primary schools are now facing falling roles and they have much greater capacity than they've had in years. I've certainly um, experienced schools closing, primary schools closing, um, because of, of, of a fall in the uh, uh, population, I suppose, of a change in demographics. So I didn't quite know what he meant when he said that about 
We've been tipped off about groups from private schools putting in applications. And then my friend Marina Perkis, who, who um, has, uh, she does some work here. She does the Troll podcast. She's a, a, a wonderful addition to political discourse in this country. She's tweeted something that she's been sent by a parent whose child is at one of these schools. And um, I'm going to read it to you in full because I love it when this happens. Danny says the... Uh, that something's going on and marina pops up on my twitter feed with the evidence so a group i'm in shared the message below so i've shared it with you that's that's the little message that she begins with and here it comes for those with kids at private schools please edit for your area and circulate far and wide so this is pinging across middle class whatsapp groups up and down these islands i have been speaking to numerous people about the vat increase and wanted to share the following as parents at various schools are becoming much more active with this becoming a very real issue i thought you would all be interested in hearing this in short the best thing for us to do is to tell all our friends to register their child for their local state school the reason being that the national union of teachers is getting worried about not being able to provision children joining state and they will lobby the government it's important they start panicking about a flood of applications coming in and the reality of the situation and then in bold even if you have no intention of moving your child now obviously the plural of anecdote is not data but it goes on the most likely scenario is that the nut will block it as in the VAT increase on school fees, or the VAT imposition on school fees, if they start seeing the reality about the number of applications for state school places. Therefore, if we can all make a concerted effort to email our councils and inquire about a school place for September 2024, we can hopefully help to make waves with this. And, and then it gives some guidance on how you might submit an application for a state school place even though you do not want a state school place for your child. So, I mean, the sense of entitlement behind that campaign is absolutely extraordinary. In order to save ourselves some money, we're going to lie. Um, because if you weren't looking for a place for your child, then you've already concluded that you can afford the 20%. Seema's not pulling any punches this afternoon. I'm so fed up with all these private school parents whinging. Tell the schools to manage their finances better and not be heavily reliant on the state benefit of acting as a charity. Perhaps they could feed all the children for 30p a meal. God, we haven't heard much from him, have we, lately? And of course I can't talk about him can i without having to read out a full list of candidates so i don't think there's such a thing as the nut anymore but you wouldn't expect the private uh, that, that particular parent to know that you've got it will be teaching unions and i have read somewhere about teaching unions having some concern if if there is a massive um exodus and and as i said that's that's one parent um sharing their whatsapp message with with one commentator with one journalist but still um it is pretty grim stuff and 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 when nick interviewed keir starmer earlier today the the rest of the media not just lbc the rest of the media then picks over the bones of that interview looking for the salient moments and questions about private education have made the headlines and i i don't know why anymore i really don't know why i used to think I don't know what I used to think on this, but what, 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 what is becoming increasingly clear? Well, listen, I'm going to tell you something, and then you tell me whether I'm right or wrong. But we'll also throw in a couple of other questions as well, just to keep things interesting. Is, is it a bigger issue than this analysis allows? So here's what I think, right? Almost everybody who has achieved a position of prominence in the British media was privately educated. I, I, I can't, I mean, I can't run through the whole roster of LBC presenters, but I am confident that a significant majority of us went to private schools. I'm thinking of all the newspapers that I've been on, and while it's not everybody, there will always be exceptions. I think for the purposes of this conversation, moving into an area, a, a catchment area for a very high-performing, non-fee-paying grammar school that's so popular it's actually had an impact on property prices in the catchment area, I think that applies as well, personally. But the, because members of the media are part of this cohort... 
the media massively misrepresents its importance in conversations. So that's theory number one. Theory number two is that this does actually speak to a, a, a fundamentally British issue. It speaks to probably the, the single most important social issue that is peculiar to these islands, and that is class. I wouldn't be surprised if this is a, a less big deal in Scotland, although Jason's saying that. I'm thinking about it, Jason. Scotland's full of private schools, mate. You can't swing a cat in Edinburgh without, without hitting some kid in a boater. But, so I don't know if that's true. But, 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 but the political salience of it is high among people who don't have skin in the game. That, that's the thing I don't know. So it's, it's one of two things, or possibly a, contra, a, a combination of both. It is either a really, really manipulated media magnifying glass, because so many of us both went there and send our children there, or it's actually an issue that speaks to much deeper questions of politics and equality politics and access and politics and aspiration so i didn't really clock until this morning how lazily i had taken the relationship between private education and aspiration it's a personal thing this why, why did my parents send me to private school because they wanted me to go further in life than i would have done if i didn't go to a school like that now it might not be true but that was their belief and they prioritized that payment over other things they could have bought because they thought that kind of education would send me further in life than a different kind of education. But, of course, thinking that that relationship between aspiration and private education is, uh, is solid tells all parents who didn't send their children to private school that they had less aspiration for their children than my parents did, or than other other parents did. 16 minutes after 12 is the time. Um, why? Why is Keir Starmer's private school policy, wh why does it get so much attention? But crucially, can I say this? Can I say, why do we like talking about it so much? And then you can send me a text, and well, I don't like talking about it, and that's fine. But you need to tell me why you don't think it is an interesting issue. Is it interesting because journalists have so much skin in the game? Or is it interesting because of what it says about the British condition or the English class system? Lee says, it's true by virtue of the fact that you are on the radio right now. I think I agree with you, Lee. I, I, don't, I don't think I would be doing what I'm doing now if I hadn't been to the sort of school that I went to or the specific school that I went to I'd love to believe that I that I would have done if I'd gone to you know a, a normal school but I don't I don't I don't know um I don't I don't, I don't think so actually but and, and and Stan makes a point cry me a river where was the outrage when Shaw starts and libraries were closing and and that's a really good point but that's why I think it might be a much more political conversation than much of the media realises. Much of the media is just whining because they're worried that they're going to be affected by it and they think that everybody else is like them. So there's been two articles in the Mail recently, one uh, or one in the Mail about a boy who was worried that he might have to go to a state school. I'll read you bits of that because I thought it was a parody. And one about somebody whose parents could only afford to send one child privately and, um, and so sent their second son to a comprehensive school which I thought was a little bit weird. Um, if, if, certainly if that was me, I'd have sent neither of them privately. But I want to know what you think. I want to know what you think about the popularity and the salience of this conversation. Is it skewed by journalistic self-interest or does it speak to an eternal truth about the class system in this country? It's 12.19. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. And if you hit the numbers now... You will get through. James O'Brien on LBC. So here's an interesting dichotomy. My friend Scott has messaged me to say, on planet Earth, literally no one is talking about VAT on private schools. So I checked that with Eleanor, the, the, the producer of the programme, who didn't go to private school, but some of her friends did. And, and they are. The friends who went to state schools and, and, and private schools are talking about this quite a lot. So that, I don't know whether that's an age thing or, or is it a graduate? Could it be a graduate thing? I don't want to sound snobbish, 
But it's a conversation among the graduate class more than it is about the non-graduate class. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I genuinely don't know. I've got to stop saying that. Whenever I say I don't know, I always add I genuinely don't know, as if I sometimes pretend not to know things. I, don't, I do know, but it's a, shut up, James, and take some calls. Jane's in Winslow. Jane, what would you like to say? Hi, Jane. Hello. Um, I, I just think you, I, was, I called when you were talking about aspiration yes. and saying that you know, parents send their children to private school because they've got aspirational views, blah, 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 and that Keir Starmer <laughs> has said this morning that that didn't you, Hang on a minute. Just, hey, hey, hey. When you are relaying back to me things that you've heard me do on the programme, could you avoid <laughs> saying blah, 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 please, Jane? <laughs> you know what I mean. I do know I'm what you mean. Blah, I'm blah, blah. the fact that I'm conscious of the fact that you're not going to give me very much time. Of course, so I'm I, of course to get I, to I, oh, okay, all right, carry on, carry yeah. on, carry on. So basically, what you've said that you think that it occurred to you suddenly like a light bulb. That was the impression I was getting. Yeah, a bit. That, you know, he mentioned that all parents are aspirational. Well, I take issue with that because I don't think all. I think most. No. I agree, but you can't say all, so let's be clear about that. Well, there Secondly, were people at my public school whose parents weren't aspirational. They, they, no, were, exactly. they, they were out of sight, out of mind, and they, they were the well, fifth yeah. generation of people to go to that school, and because they owned half of half of Hampshire, it was just a, yeah. as natural as yeah. breathing. Snobbery. Yes. Snobbery. There's certain snobbery, you know, and, and you will know, because of the school that you went to, that mm. quite often in those particular families where that's just what happens, grandparents pay for their grandchildren to give the parents breathing space, and then the, when those parents become grandparents, they pay for their grandchildren oh, yeah. and so on and so forth. Probably. And that's how the generational thing it does. That's what happens. Yeah. There are, but, but, but my point was that there are wider reasons, which I think is why this debate is so interesting and so many people want to talk about it. There are those on the hard left who absolutely despise the idea of, you know, like Angela Rayner, yes. despise the idea that state, that private schools could exist. She wants to disband them completely. She wants to compulsory purchase or whatever it is, take over the buildings and turn them into state schools, how she would decide who went there. God only knows, but there you go. And then there's the others who sort of sit there. And I personally think that most parents, if they have the opportunity to send their child to a fairly middle of the road a private day school where the class sizes are 15 to 20 mm. and you know there are opportunities that don't exist in the state system because the days are longer the discipline is better generally gross generalization there is a range of state schools available but i'm talking generally yeah then that would probably do that but then there are other reasons which are very important. But only, but only seven percent do, and that includes the, the really because fancy the, schools as well. So, so you because, can't use the, the word most, I don't think, in this context. No, I said, I said, if they could afford it, and the reason oh, they I, don't yeah. is because they are so eye-wateringly high. Yes. My last child that went to public school cost me forty-five thousand pounds a year for his after tax. Please hold. <laughs> that's, how many years have I been doing this job? That's never has that ever happened before. I don't think that's ever. <laughs> oh, I don't know what happened there. Can we try and get Jane back, please? I think she's got the headmaster on the other line. Shay's in Acton. Shay, what would you like to say? Hi, I've wanted to talk to you about this topic for so long. Please I finally, hold. Finally got the I finally got the chance. Carry um, on. I I basically am a, an immigrant's child who was sent to private school yes. on this aspirational basis. I'm, I'm black and my parents said to me, look, uh, in order for you to compete at the same level as your white counterpart, we're going to find this extra money. Obviously, they did have good jobs. We're going to find this extra money for you to go. Sure. So that was very much how it was sold to me so that I would be on the same level. And yes. now I run a tutoring I run a tutoring business so I get children into private school around the area. Yep. Um, and I would say, yeah, it's the aspiration. This, this this topic is tapping into something in the psyche, in the British psyche, which actually is something you taught me about the frustrated millionaire. Even though I am not a millionaire, yeah. if I was a millionaire, this is what I would do. And I feel like the same thing is happening with private schools. Even though 93% of people in this country can't afford it, they're still operating or thinking about it on the basis of, if I could afford it, would I want to be paying VAT? And so I'm on the ro I'm on the wrong end of inequality, but I might be yeah. on the right end of it one day. Therefore, I'm in favour of inequality. Exactly that. Oh, I don't but know I've, about it on this I've, one. I've, 
But the thing is, the thing for me is, I just think Keir Starmer could be selling this in a much better way. So what I, I think he needs to hammer home that VAT mm. does not need to be passed on to the parent. No, like, of the course. school can absorb it. Right? So the school can, it doesn't have to be passed on. And secondly, if I were him, what I would do is I would, I would give the private schools a choice. So I would say, look, if you don't want to pay the VAT, Charity status is going to be defined by me. I will tell you how, what percentage of children you need to take from underprivileged backgrounds. Mm. I will tell you what the, the fee, what, how much the parent has to earn. Because I think these private schools do get away with murder with their bursaries. It's not good enough. I would dictate that. And then I would say, if you don't want that, you start paying DOT. Simple as. So you'd give Very them a simple. chance to you provide. Give them a choice. I, well, you I, I give disagree. Them a I, dis- I know you, you credit me with opening your eyes to that Steinbeck line about there being no such thing as poverty in the Dust Bowl era of America, just temporarily frustrated millionaires. And I think on things like yeah. inheritance tax, it definitely applies. But yeah. I, what we would need both of us to speak to people who are in the category that we're talking about rather than just positing that it exists. But, uh, but, but Fine, just briefly, because I, I want to go back to Jane, who's no longer on hold. Briefly. Yeah. What's the difference between aspiration and snobbery? Because this is the point she was making. We all say aspiration, but actually what these parents are trying to buy is is a golden ticket. It's, it's, it's an un- as- I, aspir- no, no. Ah, here it is, Shay. Okay. Aspirations yeah. is a good thing. Aspiration sounds is a I positive. Know. But I would but, say but buying an unfair advan- buying an yeah. unfair advantage is not a good thing. Honestly, if you have talked to every single parent I work for, yeah. if you if they thought that there was a state school Oh, which is why they all pile into Tiffin yeah. all the time. They all take the exam for Tiffin because they're like, the, for them, this is a school Tiffin in West London, a private school. Which it's is a free. private school without paying, yes. which is free. If there were schools like that available, trust me, not one of them would pay a penny for the private school. No, but they that's that's an it. almost unique example they're, they're, because they'd then be getting a private school education for free. I mean, that's like some it of the grammar just, schools but, in Kent and some of the other examples as well. But, but they but, used to think that about Holland Park as well. Yeah, we're being too school. specific on... I mean, it's, it's something you don't hear me say very often, but I think we're being too focused on the West London, rarefied West London conversations. I have enough of them off air. But I, but I hear you, and I know exactly what you're saying, and I, and I don't agree. Although you're closer to the action than I am, so possibly I'm being a bit arrogant. It's the first time for everything. Shay, thank you. Back to Jane in Winslow. Just push me, because we're short of time now. Back to that difference, which I think is really interesting, between aspiration and snobbery. So I wasn't saying that I just think that all parents who send their children to private school are snobs. I'm one of them, so I don't think I'm a snob per se. Very, but su- I do very think few a- snobs do think that they're snobs. Well, it's one of no, the first first fine. marks of snobbery, that, I think. That, that, <laughs> well, OK, so call me a snob. I don't really no, I'm not calling it. I don't need to use that sort of language. I don't, I don't care. I no. don't care what you think in that okay. respect. I'm just saying that I think that there are other factors rather than simple aspiration. Yes. And so the point I was making your, to your producer is it was interesting this morning when Nick was talking to Keir Starmer and he said there was a question from a headmistress, if you remember, and she was an SEN t- at yes. school, basically. And the numbers were that basically about 7,000, I think it was, from the figures that of her pup- of the national pupils that are in SEN private schools provision have got EP, EPNs, you know, e- EHCPs. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, have got, have got, uh, health, which, which means that the local authority is paying their school absolutely. fees because the provision absolutely. of education is not it's available in the state sector. Yes, yes, I mean, he yes. could exempt no. them. He could, I mean, that, that policy well, that could be what, tweaked. That, that's what he was saying. Yes. However, this isn't my point. My point well, you is... You need to hurry up a bit. The whole, I'm trying to. The whole plethora of other students that don't have that plan... Are, will not be exempted. Now, those kids aren't... With, 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 with special needs, yes, you're, you're, you're right. That, and and that, is, that is a powerful argument of, about a tiny proportion of people in, in the private sector. And I, I'm not suggesting that it is undone by statistics published this weekend by the Department for Education, but certainly claims from the Independent Schools Council that pupil numbers were falling has been rather effectively scotched by data published last week by the Department of Education showing that as of January of this year, long after this policy was first announced, the number of the total number of pupils in independent schools in England had actually gone up um, an increase of, of just just over twenty four thousand on on the previous year. But you, but but your point stands for for a very specific and vulnerable 
uh, proportion of the cohort. It is half past 12, and Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. Okay, I found it, and it's real, and it's even madder than I remembered. Because I haven't been paying that much attention to this debate, because in the great scheme of uh, a change of government... It doesn't seem to me to be that important, even though historically I'm, I'm fascinated by the relationship this country has with private education. But this this one thing did sort of pop up on my radar, and it is it is absolutely extraordinary. And it, it's very much of a piece with a message that Emma sent me about the tone of this conversation, the tone of this entire conversation um is such an indictment of our expectations of the state school system you talk about it as if parents of children at normal schools 93 percent of parents or the parents of 93 percent of children all, all lack aspiration and don't want the best for their children it's insane and that has to be a consequence of uh, private education being so overrepresented in the media i think 80 percent of the of the top five percent of jobs or some mad statistic like that um are held by privately educated people but if i said to you true or false this was a headline on an article in the mail right true or false sneering kids drugs knife fights and no more golf or mandarin why as a private schoolboy, i'm terrified of being forced to attend a sink state school and the point i'm making about journalism is that nobody in the editorial structure at the Daily Mail paused to say, we can't print this, it's absolutely hideous. Go, what do you, you, no more golf or mandarin. My school had an 18-hole golf course. It also had a pack of beagles. This always surprises people. This often surprises people, even people who went to other public schools. I like to look down on them. Because what, what say you say? Your school didn't have a pack of beagles. No Heinz. No Heinz in your school. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. But you, how do you think that looks to somebody normal? No more Mandarin or golf. But, of course, there are state schools where Mandarin is taught, and there are probably state schools where you can play golf. In fact, I'm sure there are. So why I'm terrified of being forced to attend a sink state school tells you what the editorial hierarchy at the Daily Mail thinks of the massive majority of their own readers. It's quite, quite, quite bizarre. Uh, Therese is in Epping. Therese, what would you like to say? I, I am absolutely furious. Right, because you can't have no more golf or mandarin for you, Therese. <laughs> no more golf, no more mandarin, no more fox hunting. Uh, no, the, it wasn't for fox hunting. It wasn't for fox hunting. That, I, I, can't, I don't know what beagling is. I never did it. You won't be too surprised to learn. But they weren't foxhounds. They were beagles. It's a different thing. This is what posh people do is they invent stuff just to make the rest of us feel excluded. But it wasn't fox and, hunting. I think they the were thing all is, smoking. Sorry. Carry on. And the thing is, James, because I'm working class, I wouldn't know what beagling is. So it excludes me. Mate, I went oh. to the school with a pack of beagles and I don't know what beagling is. <laughs> I am absolutely furious. How dare people say we have no aspiration? Mm. My husband is a roofer. I defy you to find anybody that's worked harder than him. Yeah. Up on roofs, freezing weather, rain, not getting paid, all this nonsense. And I was a secretary. Our two boys had to attend the local state school, which was in special measures. But we both, he was determined they would not follow down his route, even though the first thing in our families, both sides go to university, he was determined they would have better. Mm. So we worked hard. We made them work hard at that school and help them as much as we could because I said, if you get your grades at GCSEs, you can pick your six form because then they need you for their for their rankings and that's exactly what happened both of them went to good red brick Leeds. he did a both got masters masters in lead in um in chemistry uh, the the other one that that one got onto the nhs grad scheme have you any idea how hard that is and then he's got a second master's courtesy of the grad scheme the other wow. one went to york university Got, uh, uh, and then went to um, King's for his master's in English. The first one has just been promoted to be a director of a local 
uh, NHS Trust. The second one's rising up. How dare these people say that we I love don't you. have aspirations? I love you to my because child. yeah, because what you've done is identify the insidiousness of that phrase that I'm afraid I have heard so many times. We worked really hard to afford the fees because the implicit accusation there is that you and your husband just should have worked harder and then you could have sent your kids to a school like the kind of people that say, we work bloody hard. So it might be true, but it's got absolutely nothing to do with the reality of the inequality. No, and the other thing I would say to you, our dentist that I went to, he sent his three children to private school. And he said to me, all three of them, he said to me at the end, because they were similar ages, where did, where did they go again? What happened? And do you know what he said to me? Go on. Christ, I, <laughs> mine have done no different, and I've paid out all that money. That's what he said. And I said, that's because you're not a smart working class woman. Well, I was that's about it. to say that there, there is also an unfair advantage in the great scheme of things, is that not every kid has a mum like you. No, no, that's not, I don't hate them people. And also, the final, another thing I would say, Good Lord. these people that write, well, I'm so angry, <laughs> that write all this, <laughs> that write all this about, oh, um, you know, they haven't got aspiration and all that. What are they afraid of? Are they afraid of competition? Are they afraid if they all went to the same school, perhaps their child would not rise up like my two, our two boys have? Is that what they're afraid of? I think, yeah, exactly that. And this is is true of all of us, actually. I'd love to think that I would, um, I'd be here now talking to you in my lovely job if I'd gone to a, a, a normal school, but I wouldn't. I just don't think I would. And that's the thing they're all terrified of admitting. Of course they're afraid of the competition. It's it's like such an obvious way in which to give your kid a... B- and I, I defend it on the grounds of why wouldn't you want your kid to have an unfair advice? What? I understand. I, I, understand. I yeah. have no issue with you but, sending your children or anybody else to private school, but don't dare look down on me and my husband. Or or pretend that it's not an unfair advantage. Exactly. That's the maddest phoning I've ever done. When I had mums queuing up to tell me there's nothing unfair about it at all. I'm not paying for an unfair... I said, what are you paying for then? Well, uh, but, uh, it's social life. That's an unfair advantage. (laughs) It's, you know, the old school time. Um, Let let me read you this. Are you ready? Is is it going to make me angry? Yeah, oh yeah. (laughs) It might make your head explode. This is from the mail. This is the article from the mail. It's beginning to dawn on me that I could be sitting next to pupils who don't care about doing well, who sneer when I put my hand up to ask or answer questions and, worst case scenario, may even carry a knife or drugs in their school blazers. I googled this the other day and school violence is statistically more likely to occur in a state rather than private setting, according to a 2020 study by the University of York. Mm. Oh, oh, that's that's, 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 um, scandals where people in really the upper echelons of our society have had taken drugs at schools like Eton or places like they have. We've never had that. Yeah, but hang on a minute, mate. <laughs> you don't know what I got expelled for, do you? <laughs> what was it? Yeah, you a bit, it? bit close to the bone on that one. I know you're being sarcastic, but when I got expelled for pub- from public school for drug-related offences, it made the news at 10. With that because drugs are everywhere. No, I know you don't. You're pointing out what's this kid worried about. It's not, it's, it's, yes, I know. And maybe not they're knives. Everywhere. Maybe not knives. I don't know. <laughs> maybe not knives. I don't know. But I would like to tell you, neither of my sons carried knives either, or their friends. What? What? <laughs> Shut up. You're absolutely right. I love your mixture of fury and laughter. Because it is hilarious. It is hilarious for this kid to say, they might might laugh at me if I ask a question. And I I suppose we have to wait till Mystery Hour now to find out what beagling is, don't we? (laughs) What do they do? I I have no idea. I wonder if that's the maddest thing you can have at a private school. Beagles. Um, I I, I, I just, I don't don't even know. I I just heard them barking sometimes. When I was walking past, uh, Therese, thank you, and 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 it is just there, isn't it? And I do think, as a as a, a phone in host, I've I've been, I've been pretty good on this over the years, but I haven't been as good as Therese. I've missed the uh, implicit accusation in that phrase. I work very hard to send my children because I say it about my dad. My dad did work very hard. So did my mum, you know. Uh, and yet, even bringing that into the conversation is distinguishing you or seeking to distinguish you from parents who work less hard this this article is absolutely extraordinary um 
As mum puts it, everyone loves the downfall of someone perceived to be financially well off. It's a perception that irritates me and isn't true. Of course, there are certain families with kids at my private school for whom the proposed addition of VAT will make no difference. But there are many more pupils whose parents, like mine, make huge sacrifices to put their children through private education. Well, you could just um, cancel your Netflix subscription and eat fewer avocados. Or, of course, you could start... Um, Cooking for 30p a meal, because that's really easy as well, apparently. It's kind of, I'm, I listen, I, I'm being a little glib, but I, I, I found Therese's anger infectious. And when you tie it to that line about um, working hard and aspiration, you realise what an ugly and skewed conversation this is. Largely, I think, as a consequence of how many people doing jobs like mine went to schools like mine. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 12.48. Um... I, it, it seems to me that everybody who didn't go to private school can see with absolute clarity the fundamental unfairness of private education, albeit that you may subscribe to that slightly Steinbeckian uh, principle of I, I'm in favour of inequality even though I'm on the wrong end of it because one day I might be on the right end of it. Uh, I don't want to abolish it because I might be able to afford it one day, in other words. I don't, want to, I, I don't want to increase inheritance tax because I might be eligible to pay it one day. Unlikely, to be honest, when you look at the state of estates in this country, but it, it's still valid, a valid position. But so many people who've taken advantage of the unfair advantage refuse to see it as, as an unfair advantage. That's the thing that's always baffled me most, is why people like me struggle to admit that they probably wouldn't be enjoying all of the uh, uh, benefits of life that they enjoy if they hadn't had parents who paid a ton of money to send them to a fancy school. Their schools wouldn't exist if they didn't deliver on the promise. So you go to a normal school and uh, there's more meritocracy, I think. I think merit. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I've done enough talking. I just want a quick word to Anne-Marie, who's texted me to say, I'm glad I didn't turn over to, to Capital Chill now. Really good callers about private schools, says Anne in Streatham. Well, I, I'm very glad as well. So the, the VAT, maybe people are worried about the eventual abolition of... Uh, of private schools but why would you even be scared of that because then if you come out on top if your kid does well in life and there were no unfair advantages at the beginning then your kids are done you know think about it it's like a running race where everyone starts at different places and, and it, a society should be about trying to make the starting line the same for everybody not trying to have a staggered start so that some people I, I know i know that life's not like that but education could be Education could be. It's 10 to 1. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Uh, Jane's in Wandsworth. Jane, what would you like to say? Hi, Jane. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Loud and clear. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I probably am that person that you've spoken about multiple, multiple times over the last few minutes. Like, you know, I can see that it's an unfair disadvantage, but I also get really saddened by the whole rhetoric around it because it feels like it's a political move by Labour and it feels like it's the politics of envy. And, you know, I think closing the gap by elevating state sector outcomes is healthy, but I think doing so by hurting private schools in the short term, you know, implementing it very bluntly, I think is um, the wrong thing to do. Well, I, I, I mean, I find the politics of envy a, 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 historically a very unhelpful phrase. But I mean, it's not politics of envy from me because I, 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 I'd taken advantage of private education both as a pupil and as a parent. So where am I coming from on this? Yeah, I mean, I, like, I, as, as in, what do you mean that you? Well, it you can't be envy for me, can it? Because I can afford it and I do it. So why, why am I in favour of this policy then? Because yeah, because it's a I bit mean, of a, it's a bit of a, a, a yeah. of a an easy get yeah. out politics of envy and I personally I think it's complete rollocks I think it's a commitment yeah. to equality while simultaneously refusing to let people like you give advantages to your children that I'm going to deny to my children in a, in an unfair universe so if it's not politics of envy for me what is it I think you know like look I I like you know like yourself you know I went to private school but I also went to state school I'm one of those people that you know I went to state school up until I was 14 they actually my parents sent my yeah, brother but I just to I'm just school. picking up on the politics of envy line because it can't possibly yeah. be politics of envy for me so what is it yeah well I think that you know you want equality and you know it's not politics of envy for you and you want yeah. equality and I understand that and maybe and that's what Keir Starmer that. wants as well 
I think, yeah, he does. And I think all of us do. You know, I do as well. I want that for all children. But I think what worries me is the way that the Labour government are looking to bring this in so bluntly and the effects on... Well, it's not like blunt, is it? Blunt would be to announce abolition. Well, so, it, it, removing it, it charitable will, status yeah. or, or, or insisting that you pay VAT on your school fees in the same way that you pay VAT on your on your takeaway food or your eat-in food, rather. It's, it's not exactly a blunt instrument. And you know the numbers have gone well, up. They've gone up since well, the policy was announced. I, I, I'm not sure I can... I would agree with that, but... but these the are numbers. the Department of Education statistics that were published last week. I think... Yeah, I mean, I can't comment on that. I'm, I'd be very surprised if they've gone up. Like, I can tell you well, right I'm now. I'm telling you, you know, that they have. That's not an opinion. It's counting. The Department of Education published figures are up uh, in January, up to January of this year, long after the policy was known, and, the, and they've gone up by 24,150 pupils across England alone. Private school applications have. Yes, private, private school well, attendance. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed. That, you know, I find that really surprising because I know from talking to everyone, you know, we're lucky enough to send, you know, we both work full time. You know, we're lucky enough to send. Our so, so did Therese. School. Therese worked full time. Her husband was a roofer and she was a secretary. I, I completely understand that. You know, I completely understand that. I think that, you know, unfortunately in life, and this is unfortunate, and I know this is unfortunate, but they're unfortunately in life, you know, you are going to have people that have more and have people that less and we can all strive for equality and we all want equality and we all want people who use the phrase politics of envy don't want equality jane they want well, en- they want entrenched privilege and they want it to be protected yeah i think i, I mean i i disagree i disagree there because i think right, that, well, i'll let i'll let know, the listeners make up their mind yeah, yeah, I think that, unfortunately, can I just, you know, I want to make the comment that, you know, there are, what people do fail to realise is that there are people out there, and, you know, I'm sure this won't get sympathy from many people, but the actual living truth of it is that, you know, we've got friends that don't go on holiday, drive a battered old car, can hardly afford the private school fees of their kids, and they literally literally don't have any of the life luxuries but they do well if they get rid of the battered old car they'll be able to afford the um i mean get a bicycle they'll be able to afford the vat yeah i think you know i think that um yeah i think that i mean it's i think it's quite sad really to make a a mockery of their situation you know they're doing what they can to try and give their sorry it's it's, it's, so your theoretical friends and their theoretical battered old car shouldn't be mocked yeah, I think, okay. you know, I, I, I but, think... But, you but know, accusing people who want uh, fairer education in this country of politics of envy, that's absolutely fine. I don't think... And when you say yeah. we both work hard, what do you think you're saying about parents who can't afford to send their children to private school? No, everyone works hard. Everyone so works why mention hard, it? And I appreciate, I appreciate that because it, a lot of people think it's entitlement. A lot of people think that you're paying private ski- school fees through grandparents and everyone else. No, but when you say we both work those. hard, what are you saying about the people who work very hard but don't send their children? Or I'm can't? not saying anything about. Well, of course you people. are. So you're what's it got to do? What's it got to, what's what it got saying, to do with the conversation? What I'm doing though? is. What I'm doing is I'm making the point that we're not people that have been are having our school fees paid for us. No, you know we are trying to. But would you work less fees. hard if you were? No, no, I wouldn't. I well, wouldn't then it's work. not My it's not even work. remotely relevant then to this conversation. But I'm making well, it is because I'm making the point that we're you know we are families that are not having our private school fees paid for us. We're doing our absolute best to try and pay those. Yeah, and you know we you know we we're gonna you know we, it's gonna be very tight for us and be very tight for a lot of people and i don't think that well i mean it's already very tight for for for, for a lot of people and and the numbers as i say have gone up so i I mean most of your fears are probably unfounded but um but when you say i i I work very hard whether you intend it or not you are uh passing judgment on people who don't send their children or can't send their children to private school but um i i think i hope in the course of that conversation you 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 probably realize that Without me having to labour the point. Rob's in Penrith with the last word on this. Rob, what's it going to be? Oh, hello, James. Uh, first time on for me, so thanks for having me on. Well, I'm just uh, getting the hang of it, Rob, so we're in good company. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a former chief examiner for GCSE English, and this gave me a lot of insights into the nature of education across the country that perhaps not everybody has. And... I've seen a great deal about the state sector yes. and 
what happens in schools, having marked papers right across the spectrum. Um, and it's not a level playing field, if I can use that cliche, from place it's to a, place. It's a cliche for a uh, reason, isn't it? It is a cliche. And, um, you know, I was in teaching in the 70s when Thatcher took our playing field away as well. Um, but if I took you to a, a school, say, in a leafy suburb in somewhere like Cheshire, the results would be in inverse proportion to an inner city school where the students had not done as well yes. because they're suffering from such deprivation and disadvantage. And the money isn't in the system to support them in the way that they need for them to succeed in life. And this obsession by the right-wing press yeah. to deal with a tiny cohort of people who really don't deserve it and who are themselves very privileged in, compar in comparison. So this is, but what other... do you hear then? Because I don't, I, I, you know, it's so easy for me to agree with you and to admit that my privilege is epic and entirely undeserved. What, what do you hear when people can't acknowledge that or can't admit it? Or if I said, well, hang on, my parents work very hard or something like that. That's the bit that I still struggle with a bit. I, I think they're being entirely cloth-eared. Yes, and, I'll take that. You know, and, uh, you know, this for me by Starmer is a small step. It's a tinker. To address well, it's, no, it's more than a tinker, but it is a small step. You're right. It's a small step um, towards redressing the terrible imbalance in education that there is in this country and the massive deprivation that there is in some areas. And could I just add, by the way... Not really. My, well, I just... But well, here you are. <laughs> Go on, well, quickly. In, in well, two both, sentences. Both, two sentences, both, Rob. Both my kids went to private... Uh, to, to state school. They both got good degrees. My partner's uh, daughter went to private school because she's got severe dyslexia. She's just got a PhD. So... Really, it's about determination. Well, I imagine think. how well yeah. they, imagine how well they all could have done if only you and your partner had worked a bit harder, Rob. Oh, well, this is a later partner, I'm afraid. My oh, well, you don't. Well, I'm, a... I'm, I'm sorry to hear that, but I think I think my sarcasm had already landed. It is coming up to one o'clock. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back on Catch Up on Global Player, the official LBC app, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. Download it now for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now it's time for Sheila Folk. James O'Brien on LBC.